Uh, good morning. I welcome today's witnesses to our subcommittee hearing on public access, management, security, and the future of the union of the Union Station complex as an important intermodal for all modes of transportation. The current management structure at Union Station, uh, the Union Station Redevelopment Corporation, or USRC, was created in 1981 at the direction of Congress. And Congress later competed the air rights that will expand the, the station's capacity to become a world-class intermodal and mixed-use public-private facility. Ownership of Union Station, as the bill report reiterated and made clear, quote, shall remain with the federal government, end quote. However, we are unable to find evidence of congressional oversight of Union Station since its redevelopment. Now that there is a new uh, congressional majority with Union Station under our jurisdiction, this hearing commences regular oversight. A Union Station began as a train facility for the nation's capital whose grand design was commissioned by Congress to pr produce a landmark building. However, as rail use declined in the 1950s, the station rapidly deteriorated, and a series of failed ideas, wasted federal funds, cost overruns, major utility and move, move needs, mismanagement, and litigation resulted. In 1981, after portions of the roof collapsed during structural repairs, a Union Station was closed to the public, forcing passengers to walk a third of a mile around the closed building to the replacement station. Congress stepped up later that year and sped purchase payments on Union Station to, ob to obtain earlier planned federal ownership from Baltimore and Penn Terminal Realty. After $180 million public-private renovations, Union Station reopened to public applause in 1987, fully restored. The congressional authorization to purchase Union Station mandated the creation of a management structure, the return of the station to its important rail beginnings, transition to an intermodal center, and the private investment that has resulted in the retail available there today. Congress delegated to the Union Station Realty Corporation the authority and responsibility to order priorities and mediate the sectors in Union Station in order to safeguard the public interest. Like the District of Columbia itself, the Union Station complex contains a mix of federal, local, and private entities. But the overriding public interest has never been in doubt to provide the public access to a federally owned facility to expand modes of travel to and from the nation's capital and to provide a secure environment. The public uh, interest was strengthened when in 1971 the federal government created Amtrak in response to the sustained decline of passenger rail and today, and today, the Congress puts billions of dollars into Amtrak to sustain this valuable public resource. At least since 9-11, we have seen a sharp increase in riders using Amtrak, whose national headquarters is Union Station, making more rapid movement toward genuine intermodal status essential. However, we have not seen evidence that the Union Station Redevelopment Corporation understands the increasingly central role of national intermodal hubs today. Yet gas prices are driving record number, numbers of Americans to use whatever 
ground transportation is available. In March 2008, uh, March 2008 showed a 4.3 percent drop in vehicle miles traveled, the sharpest drop for any month in U.S. highway history. In 2007, American, uh, uh, the Americans' use of public transportation reached its highest levels in 50 years. What an extraordinary opportunity this is for the Union Station complex. The House has just passed the first standalone transit legislation bill since Metro was created, just as Metro is bursting at the seams. This week, Metro had its highest ridership day in its history, and eight of its top 10 ridership days have occurred this year. The House also authorized the nation's first high-speed rail uh, uh, a few weeks ago, and it will travel between the district and New York. The Capitol Visitor Center is scheduled to open in December. This new attraction, which will bring many more visitors to Washington, is one of the reasons Congress has insisted on a true intermodal center at Union Station. Today, Union Station covers 12 acres and has uh, 2,200 parking spaces, 125 retail outlets, and provides access to Amtrak, uh, the Washington Metropolitan Transit Authority, rail and bus, the Virginia Rail Exp Express, the Maryland Rail commuter uh, line, taxis, bicycle sharing, and other tourist-friendly transportation services. services. Union Station is the busiest stop on the WMATA line, with over 30,000 daily riders using this stop. Because of congressional mandates and federal funds, the intermodal uh, center at Union Station will have new parking facilities for tour buses, new rail concourses, streetcars that connect Union Station to the neighborhood, and additional security improvements. In the Balance of Budget Act of 1997, Congress directed GSA to dispose of the land over the railroad tracks at Union Station, and in 2002, the General, the General Services Administration bid and sold 15 acres of air rights above the rail yard adjacent to Union Station. The result of the sale will be Burnham Place at Union Station, a three million square foot mixed use development built above the rail yard just north of Union Station and scheduled to, ex to include expanded transportation capabilities, mixed use uh, amenities, uh, a, a hotel and the like. The concept of Union Station as a modern intermodal center was detailed in a 1967 report uh, by the National Capital Planning Commission, which envisioned combining intercity and intracity bus service uh, with intercity rail transportation. Congress has strongly supported the intermodal concept with funds in every transportation reauthorization bill since 1991 and in several annual appropriation bills. I secured $2.25 million for the study currently being conducted by the District of Columbia Department of Transportation on the Intermodal Transit Center at Union Station. Four months ago, uh, Chairman Jim Oberstar, Ranking Member John Micah, and I sent a letter to the USRC encouraging relocation of District Greyhound Intercity Bus Terminal, located several blocks to the north of Union Station. A state-of-the-art intermodal center is, by definition, a facility that allows passengers 
to seamlessly choose and get access to all modes of ground transportation. Our letter reiterated the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee's continued work on intermodal development at Union Station. I followed with another letter on May 2nd, 2008, to the USRC asking for access for additional intercity bus companies, some of which currently drop off and pick up passengers on already crowded district streets for lack of a space to drop their passengers. The response to our letter cited business relationships as a reason why Megabus was not allowed to sublease a parking spot in the parking garage. However, this is just the sort of arrangement that is needed to help Union Station more rapidly fulfill the congressional intermodal mandate while Burnham Place is being constructed and integrated over the next decade. This and other steps can be taken now to begin the process of converting what today is only a transportation hub to the world-class intermodal center Congress has mandated. Nor did the response to our letter mention any other way to accommodate Megabus or similar companies. Accommodation of low-cost inner-city bus operators should not be only incorporated uh, into USRC's business plan, but long ago should have been actively sought to increase the intermodal options available at Union Station. Reported First Amendment violations and denial of access by press and the public as well as inconsistent messages by Union Station personnel are especially troubling. In June, a photographer was detained, detained by Union Station security personnel for taking non-commercial photographs. A real-time display of the confusion about access came when Channel 5 TV, a major television outlet here, was shut down by security personnel while interviewing the chief spokesman for Amtrak, who was explaining that photography was allowed. Although management officials asserted that a ban on photography was not the policy, Channel 5, National Public Radio, tourists, and a host of amateur photographers have been shut down or given inconsistent directions on photography at Union Station. The evidence of confusion and arbitrary actions by security personnel reflects the continuing absence of clarity concerning public access. Union study appears to be a case study for the necessity of my bill, H.R. 3519, the Open Society with Security Act, to assure public safety while maintaining the highest level of free and open access to the public. The Homeland Security Committee has already indicated an interest in moving H.R. 3519, and it has been, refer and it has been referred uh, to our uh, committee by the parliamentarian. However, the Union Station Redevelopment Corporation and the Union Station Management Company are not alone responsible for the problems and issues that have been reported and have arisen at Union Station. For years, Congress has failed to provide the necessary oversight and guidance. As Congress continues to invest in its intermodal vision of Union Station, we have a responsibility to resume oversight of the entire complex. We welcome today's witnesses and look forward to hearing their testimony. I am pleased now to, uh, to ask the ranking member of the full committee for any remarks he may have. Well, thank you for recognizing 
me, and I am, a, I guess, an ex officio member of all, all the subcommittees. I'm not Sam Graves, uh, even though I wish I was young and as young and handsome as him. And uh, I regret that he couldn't uh, be with us this morning. Uh, I hadn't planned on being here, but I saw the topic and couldn't resist uh, being with uh, Ms. Norton and join her in, uh, I think, a very important oversight hearing on Union Station uh, to look at the management, public space uh, issues, and intermodal uh, access uh, questions. Uh, and uh, I commend uh, her for that. Uh, Mr. Graves is not able to be with us because of connecting flight uh, uh, difficulties. Uh, someone ought to do something about that in transportation, but that's a subject of another hearing. Uh, but I do have his statement, which I'd like entered into the record. Uh, well, again, thank you for uh, holding this hearing, and I do have a statement which I'll submit for the record. But uh, I remember Union Station, uh, when I first came to Washington, was uh, as a staffer in the, uh, well, back in the 70s. That was before Miss Norton was born, but uh, uh, actually uh, came back again, reoccurring. Uh, in the early 80s, as chief of staff in the Senate, and uh, never forget, Union Station was an uh, absolute disaster. Birds flying around, water leaking into it, a failed attempt at making it a visitor center. It was just absolutely beyond a description. And it was through a public-private uh, partnership and a substantial amount of public uh, money, too, investment that uh, we have. Uh, we're able to complete. I think Elizabeth Dole was the Secretary of Transportation. Uh, the absolutely magnificent uh, restoration, uh, util utilization of, uh, of what's become uh, a transportation hub, a commercial center of activity, uh, restoration of a beautiful public uh, building. Uh, I'm not going to get into the who can photograph what. I'll let, leave that to uh, Ms. Norton, and there's always been controversy about what could be uh, exposed in Union Station dating back to, I think it was, was it Gowdens who did the uh, uh, the statues uh, and had the nude males, which they had to cover with the shields, so maybe now we have to cover the press from uh, uncovering our, our, our barest uh, security secrets, but I'll let you deal with that. My interest today is uh, uh, that uh, we, we do conduct adequate oversight of the uh, private management and these public-private partnerships. I was uh, saddened to see that it took the developer, is it uh, Acreage, uh, Acreage or Acreage? Acreage Corporation since, ninth, uh, since 2006 uh, when they plan to do additional uh, rights uh, I, uh, I'm sorry, they do plan to do additional development and secured air rights uh, for a 3,000 square foot mixed uh, use uh, development, which would be a great addition on a comprehensive intermodal station. What's stunning to me as a former developer, it's 2008, two years, I guess, to get some of that resolved. I'm sorry for the developer. Time. Uh, cost money, and we don't see the projects evolve, but uh, maybe we'll hear more about some of the trouble they encounter. And as I understand, it has to do with some of the the height of the uh, air rights and um, the uh, issues of uh, how much uh, footage you can get into that space. And certainly, when we uh, uh, get enter into an agreement with a developer, the deal has to make sense for the developer and for the federal government and also comply with uh, some of the restrictions, but uh, hopefully we won't get ourselves into that pickle and they can move forward with the intermodal terminal uh, and uh, this new addition. Uh, as they develop that and as they make improvements at uh, Union Station, one of my concerns, and uh, Chairwoman Norton has also expressed it, is that it, it is a uh, intermodal uh, center, and that all modes uh, be accommodated at that location. She had written with uh, uh, my uh, joining her uh, our desire to see our national surface transportation carrier. Most people don't realize this, but we do have one. 
It's a private company. Its name is Greyhound. Uh, it is actually a private company that makes money and stays in business by uh, returning uh, uh, a profit. Uh, and uh, I think it, we should do everything we can uh, to accommodate that carrier, whether it be Greyhound or if in the future it's succeeded uh, with, by some other private uh, transportation company or if it has a competition, whoever provides that surface transportation should be located in not just Union Station, but in any federally funded intermodal center in the United States. The time to dump that, the time that we dump people who use Greyhound or some other surface transportation at the edge of town or in some inconvenient location uh, is, it has passed. These are not third world, third class uh, uh, travelers. These are uh, passengers who should be accommodated with intermodal uh, surface connections. Uh, and we should not fund one dollar in public money for any intermodal center, whether it's Union Station or anywhere else, without making accommodations for the, these passengers. And they do it so cost effectively and actually make a, uh, a return on investment, which is uh, amazing sometimes uh, in the realm of government thinking. But uh, the least we can do is make an accommodation for that service. So I came here this morning to make a, a plea, not only at Union Station, uh, but across the country. And we do need to look at these public-private partnerships. And I advocate them uh, and advocate working with the Chairwoman Norton, this is an incredible city to let Union Station, whether it was 1980 or uh, we have examples of the old post office, which has sat there for years, uh, uh, not utilized its, to its max, whether it's the Federal Trade Commission uh, building, the Apex building, or others, we can find solutions that work and accommodate our public need, our public facility requirements, uh, and also enhance this great, uh, this great city and other great cities uh, in that process. So uh, we need to look at these public-private partnerships, make sure, certain that we help in making them uh, go forward, uh, that they are good deals for the taxpayer, good deals for the developer and investors uh, who are our partners. Uh, so those are a couple of the points that I wanted to uh, make this morning. Um, uh, trying to see if there are any other points. I think I've covered, uh, maybe angered a few people. Maybe we uh, uh, upset a, a, a couple of folks with these radical ideas like uh, good investment of taxpayer dollars and convenience for the traveling uh, public. But uh, uh, again, I, I can't do anything but compliment Ms. Norton for uh, her time, effort, in trying to make uh, these things uh, work and be more effective and responsive, so yield back. Well, I thank the, the ranking member, and I certainly thank the ranking member of the full committee for, for attending this subcommittee hearing, but it does speak to his long involvement in uh, the Union Station uh, matter, uh, as I think his, his comments bear out, so I, uh, and I I uh, remind the committee that the intermodal concept of Union Station has been a perfectly bipartisan concept. When he was in the majority and I was in the minority, we were on the same page and we will continue to be on the same page, uh, particularly given the federal funds that are, are increasingly necessary uh, to achieve that vision. I agree with the ranking member about how long it took to get the air rights. This is one of the most frustrating uh, matters that uh, I've, I've been involved in since I've been in Congress. Obviously, you gotta let the parties negotiate, but um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Latourette was the, uh, was the chair. He and I and the uh, ranking member, uh, then ranking member, Mr. Oberstall met <laughs> Uh, in order to press this forward. It, it was uh, such a waste uh, that it, it, it took so very long. And that's why you will see Congress impatient with, with getting on with the job of intermodal uh, work and getting on with it well before 
Burnham Place <laughs> sees the light of day, this could be made an intermodal uh, transportation center now, right now, with what it has in it if uh, there was the vision to do so on the part of those in charge. Uh, in order simply to lay the predicate, because I hate to ask witnesses <laughs> about what somebody said when, when the people who said it are right here. So in order to lay the predicate for the uh, First Amendment uh, part of this hearing, I have asked uh, Aaron McCann, uh, who represents photographers who have been turned away if she would testify precisely what her experience was. Hello. Maybe it's on. Okay. Chairwoman Norton, members of the subcommittee, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I have a short statement and then I'll be happy to answer any questions. My name is Erin McCann and I'm an amateur photographer. I'm also an active member of a group called DC Photo Rights, which exists to document and discuss incidents in which photographers have been harassed by security officers or police. These officers often mistakenly believe that taking pictures in public places, places is illegal or requires a permit or is an indication that the person holding the camera is somehow a threat. I've never been clear on why exactly a camera is considered threatening. In the aftermath of the 2005 transit bombings in London, for instance, Officials appealed to the public for snapshots taken before and after the attacks in their search for clues. An open photography policy can be a security team's best friend. It also liberates security employees from the task of investigating people like me as I take photographs in the most obvious way possible. With a 10-inch lens on my camera, there is no disguising what I'm doing. In Washington, certain places have the reputation of being unfriendly to photographers. In the four years that I've been shooting in the city, Union Station has always been one of those places. In February, I began a series of phone calls and emails to Amtrak and Jones Lang LaSalle management to find out why. I've included with my written statement a timeline of my involvement and my frustrating search for answers. Often, my calls and emails have resulted in being given conflicting information, sometimes minutes apart by people in the exact same office. The statement also includes details of some of the incidents in which photographers have been harassed, told incorrect policies by misinformed station officials, and, in certain instances, been threatened with arrest for daring to take a simple snapshot of a national treasure. In almost every incident, a guard or officer has wrongly told a photographer that Union Station is private property and photography is not allowed. The reasons given for this fake policy vary. I was once told that my camera is too professional. Others have been told that the Patriot Act bans photography and train stations, a law that I'm sure would come as a surprise to the organizers of the annual Amtrak station photography contest. I've been stopped twice in the last three months while photographing in the public areas of Union Station. Both were after I received explicit assurances from Amtrak and Jones Lang LaSalle management that photography is allowed. The most recent incident was Friday, when an Amtrak employee who refused to tell me your name or identify herself in any way said the, public, said the building was private property and that all photography is prohibited. For many tourists, Union Station is a first stop and a first impression of the nation's capital. For a family to be warned or even threatened upon arrival for simply taking photos in one of the city's beautiful public places is reprehensible. My interest now is the same as it was in February when I first started asking questions. One to understand what the photography policy is at Union Station. Two, to assure that if there are restrictions on photography, they are clearly posted throughout the building. Three, to make sure that those restrictions are fair, given the station's unique ownership and its role as a major gateway for thousands of the city's visitors each year. And finally, and most importantly, I want to make sure that the private guards, Amtrak police, and everyone else in a position to interact with the public understands what the policy is. Despite repeated assurances from the management of Amtrak and Jones Lang LaSalle, ill-informed station employees are still taking it upon themselves to interpret the policy as they see fit or to make up contradictory policies. Amtrak and Jones Lang LaSalle have so far been unable to communicate the policy to their security employees. I believe Washington DC's train station deserves smart, well-trained, high-quality security, and my experience with its representatives so far has been exceedingly disappointing. Curious about how other cities and stations handle photography, it took me 30 seconds on Google to come up with the policy at Grand Central Terminal in New York City. They post it right there on their website and they welcome photographers with open arms. It's taken over six months and dozens of conversations, not to mention a congressional hearing, to understand the policy at Union Station. And we still have no guarantee that when new guards or officers are hired, they too won't automatically assume that a camera is a threat. 
My hope is that after today, visitors to Union Station will be free to explore and photograph the building without being viewed as lawbreakers. Security officers and Amtrak employees should have more important things to do than investigate a tourist with a camera. Thank you. Well, I'm a member of the Homeland Security Committee, and the notion that security guards in a facility like Union Station are busy um, keeping track of photographers rather than trained uh, the way the airlines are now training uh, people to spot uh, those who may do us some damage. It's very distressing uh, to hear. But what is most distressing is to hear that you were stopped twice, according to your testimony, in the last three months yes. in public areas of the station. Where were you? Uh, uh, the first incident was on, let me find my actual timeline here. Um, was in the beginning, middle of May, middle of May, uh, May 14th. This was after the uh, NPR photographer was stopped and threatened with arrest. Um, I read his post and- The NPR photographer, uh, do you know about that? Yes. Um, tell us about the NPR photographer. Uh, sure, do you want me to do that first and then tell you my incident? Sorry? Do you want me to do that first and then tell you my incidents or? Uh, either way. Okay, um, well the, the NPR photographer, he was there as a private citizen, he just happens to work for NPR. Um, he was using a tripod in the Great Hall, and as far as I've been able to tell from Jones Lang LaSalle, the tripod use is actually prohibited. Um, but once that issue was cleared up, he, was, he had, um, I think, four separate security officers telling him conflicting statements about why exactly he couldn't take photos. One said that it was the tripod, one said that it was the camera. Um, two or three of them threatened him with arrest. Um, I have a summary of the incident on page eight of my testimony, yeah, yeah. and it also includes a link to his were, were, were those who threatened with arrest security officers or peace officers? They were the ITC, the private security officers in, who were contracted by Jones Lang LaSalle. Um, so I read his post and his account, and having spent several months and knowing at least as far as management told me that photography was allowed and knowing that security guards- How did guards management relay to you that photography was allowed? Was yes. it in writing? Yes. Uh, I got an email from Joan Mulkowski, who is the vice president for Union Station from Jones Lang LaSalle on, I believe in February. She said, in general, we do allow individuals to take pictures for their personal non-commercial use. However, from time to time, it is necessary to prohibit photography depending on the situation. Uh, and then she went on to say that Camera, using a tripod or taking professional pictures with, without the express written permission of Union Station management is prohibited. What happened was they posted these signs around the station forbidding tripod photography, and my understanding is that security guards read those signs and interpreted them to mean that all photography is prohibited. Sorry, the security guards read what signs? Uh, Jones Lang LaSalle posted some uh, prohibitions around the station. Uh, it was things like no running, no skateboarding, and along in the very bottom of their list of things that they prohibit in the station, they include uh, tripod photography or taking professional pictures. Um, these signs went up after I first contacted Jones Lang LaSalle. I think they went up around late March or early April. They're unclear on the rights of private photographers to take snapshots or artistic photos or anything at all. The only thing that they prohibit of is course, the, photography. Are you, are you talking about the, are you talking about the list, the, the 18, the 18 um, prohibited uses? Yes, and I think photography, tripod photography, is either 17 or 18 on that list. Well, uh, on, 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 on that list, of course, it goes on to say Union Station reserves right to prohibit photography of any kind Yes. in their sole discretion. Yes, and that's where the confusion comes in because well, the guards- Well, confusion, who wouldn't be confused about it uh, are, are the courts of the United States of America. Uh, this is a public space, and then you go to, uh, from, from tripods, and by the way, at our discretion, whenever we feel like it, <laughs> we, we can just, uh, without giving any indication of what kind of photography we're talking about? I mean, this is, this is, this is pathetic. When but I the, timeline that you've, um, the timeline that you've laid out, I think 
sends the message to Union Station, you don't know who you're fooling with. These are very serious, educated people. And they're not, that's why I put her on. They're not simply reporting by hearsay. They have written evidence of their own. They have your written evidence. And you're continuing to see these issues. Now, the next thing that's going to happen is, is, a, is a lawsuit. Can I, um, may I tell you about the two, my specific two incidences? Uh, the first came after the NPR photographer was stopped when I was standing there with my camera. This is the camera that I carry around. It's got a very large lens on it. It is not a professional camera. Um, one of the guards who stopped me told me that my camera was too professional. What is a professional camera? You're a photographer. What is a professional camera? I'm unclear on that. I, I know at one point I asked, after a security guard told me that my camera was too professional, I asked Joan Mulkowski if they were going to distribute a list of specific cameras and lenses that were allowed and were not allowed, if that was the argument that they were going to make. And the, the guard that I spoke with that night, he was very polite, but he just, he was confused. Uh, he had gotten conflicting information from me and from his superiors, and he just didn't know. And so that night I told him that I'd been talking with Joan Mulkowski and he tried to call her to get some background information and he couldn't get in touch with her. She had already left for the day. He told me that because I could say her full name and had clearly had some sort of interaction with her, he would let me shoot that night. There were, it was him and another guard and I got the impression that if I hadn't dropped her name, I, I know I would not have been allowed to take a photo that night. And I was very upset when I left because it wasn't about me. It was about making sure that this didn't happen to somebody who hadn't spent six months mm -hmm. emailing management to try to get an answer. Uh, the most recent incident that I encountered was last Friday. And that was when I was standing in the Amtrak area. And a woman at the Amtrak security kiosk, as soon as I pulled my camera out at 6.45 in the morning, the woman at the Amtrak security kiosk told me that I had to put it away. She said, Amtrak is private property. I was not allowed to take any photos anywhere in the building. She was speaking for Amtrak, the Amtrak area and the Jones Lang LaSalle area. She said, no photography whatsoever anywhere in the building. I asked her for her name. She was standing there with a name tag at the Amtrak security kiosk. She turned her name tag around and told me she did not have to give me her name. Um, a police officer, a uniformed Amtrak security officer came up next to her and took me aside and I chatted with him gave him some of the background. Uh, he called his supervisor who told him that, yes, I'm allowed to take photographs. Um, and I asked that officer, what happens when I leave, somebody else comes up, and the woman who refused to give her name interacts with another photographer or a family of tourists who are just arriving down from New York on the Northeast Regional train and are told to put their camera away. This happens all the time. And it's, it depends on what guard is there, who's working, what their impression of the policy is in Amtrak or in the jones Lang LaSalle area. They're just making it up on the spot. The, your testimony concerning the guard leads me to, they are the outward invisible sign of a uh, an outrageously pathetic policy. They, they're carrying out a non-policy. They're doing whatever they feel like doing, and uh, it raises very serious questions about their training, um, uh, about, about uh, and all of this goes back to the management. <laughs> People do what you tell them to do, what you uh, train them to do. Um, do you believe that there is any new signage in Union Station that verifies the uh, policy on photography or public access? Absolutely not. Um, right now, the signs, when you enter the building, there are, are there actually old signs that, that actually say no photography allowed. The Amtrak security officer that I spoke with on Friday told me, he, he referred to them as the old signs. Um, he also said that he said what? I'm sorry. Uh, the signs that are on the outside of the door that prohibit they, all how photography. How are those signs mounted? Uh, I believe they're actually painted on the glass. So painted on the glass, is painted on the glass the words Union Station is private property? I don't know if it actually says that. It does say photography is not allowed. 
Um, but he told me that since he'd been working there. Otherwise when, known as written in stone. Right. Um, he told me that when he first started working there, and his name tag said that he'd been working there since 2007, that when he first started, that photography was not allowed anywhere in the station. His understanding was that it had been prohibited for a very long time and that had only recently been allowed. So it's nobody quite knows when it was allowed, when it wasn't allowed, but the, one, the, the signs on the outside of the station do say prohibited, and then the Jones Lang LaSalle signs are, that are put up say that it is the, the private property, they reserve the right to restrict photography, that the no tripods, those signs. So right now, there's absolutely no clear indication anywhere in the building that photography is allowed. And when a photographer is stopped and, and they're asked, they're, and they ask, you know, where, where is this posted? Um, security guards, at least the, the Jones Lang LaSalle ITC security guards generally refer to the, the, the posted sign saying, no, that we reserve the right to prohibit photography. Uh, another photographer that I've spoken with in the last couple of weeks was stopped in the Amtrak area and was told that he, he was told that the, that it, the whole building is private property, no photography allowed. He asked for a list of station rules and two Amtrak officers refused to give them to him. And one referred to the no photography rule as being an unwritten rule. So right now people are stopped and they have nowhere to go because the management who are actually in the building and the people that they will refer you to will tell you that no photography is allowed. When I first started making calls to Amtrak, the first three or four people that I spoke with told me photography wasn't allowed. It was after I sort of became very upset and made a pain of myself after learning about the Amtrak photography contest that I finally asked to be transferred to somebody in the, in the corporate relations office who could explain it to me. And she told me that it appeared that the security and Am the Union Station station manager and other people in the station were taking a policy that was set up for news photography and applying it to all photography. And what it is for news photography, if you want to take, if you wanted to do like a news story and go down on the tracks and get photos or video of a train arriving, you do need an Amtrak es escort as, as far as their policy is concerned. But again, employees are seeing this policy for news or professional photographers and they are applying it to anybody with a camera. Tourists have been stopped, I've been stopped. I don't really make a distinction between myself and a tourist. They don't know that I live in DC when they're telling me that I can't photograph. Um, it's nobody, everybody there just sort of makes up the policy on the spot. Miss McCain, these, <laughs> these <laughs> intrusions into uh what would be considered, even in many private facilities, ordinary uh, kinds of actions um, uh, are particularly troubling to me um, as a public official and someone who um, had some uh, experience as a lawyer uh, in First Amendment matters. So I really have, who taught who taught labor law where the notion of what's a public place and what's a private place comes up all the time and where the courts have um, been clear about the importance of the First Amendment. Of course, the First Amendment <laughs> uh, could not be more important in uh, a facility owned by the people of the United States of America. Um, I have put you on uh, first because I thought that Union Station leaders should have the opportunity to hear directly and that I, it should not be a matter of my hearsay, that they should hear directly the complaints that have come so that they could respond. And the reason I thought I had to do that is that Union Station has repeatedly said that it does not bar photography. So while I do not know what your testimony would say, the fact that you have taken the trouble to go through a timeline to indicate uh, precisely when you or others encounter, and particularly you, because you have been real clear about your own um, experience, uh, encountered these violations of, of policy. Uh, this is only fair so that Union Station perhaps doesn't know. The law we have a notion, know or should have known, but perhaps doesn't know uh, at 
at this hearing, if they didn't know, they found out. And they found out, I think, thanks to you uh, and to what is really very, very, uh, uh, very uh, closely uh, written and documented testimony now, if it's not true, uh, test, uh, the union station can come forward and say it's not true. Uh, but in any case, they're certainly going to have to respond. Uh, as a member of Congress who represents this city, you, I want to offer my apologies uh, to the amateur photographers who have experienced uh, this treatment in a facility uh, that enjoys the patronage of the Congress of the United States through funding. And we're having this hearing, obviously, not only because of your complaints, uh, but because we haven't had a hearing on Union Station. And when you leave people on their own for decades, then they develop their own policies. Uh, that ceases today. And I thank you very much, uh, Ms. McCain, for your testimony. Thank you. Could we ask the president of the Union Station Development Corporation to come forward, David Ball, um, the assistant general manager, Jones uh, Lang LaSalle Incorporated, Brian Chambers, and uh, the counsel for the acquisition company, Askinski uh, Acquisition Corporation, Daniel. Levy. Well, why don't you begin, Mr. Ball? Good morning, Chairwoman uh, Norton, ranking members uh, and members of the subcommittee. I'm David Ball, President of the Union Station Redevelopment Corporation, <coughs> or USRC. I'm very pleased to be here this morning on behalf of USRC to testi testify about management at Union Station, its intermodal uses, and other important matters concerning the care and custody of our uh, Washington Union Station that has been entrusted with USRC. Uh, I also want to thank Ms. McCain for her testimony this morning. Um, USRC is a small office, and um, we serve as the trustees for this public building that is privately held. First and foremost, Union Station is a train station and a retail success for Washington, D.C. It is Washington's intermodal transportation facility serving MARC, VRE, Amtrak, WMATA buses, and uh, Metro Rail. On average day, there are over 1,200 taxi pickups and most likely an equal number of taxi discharges at the station. About 12,000 tour buses a year park in the garage and over 32 million people a year go in and out of the station. In 2005, USRC obtained a $38 million construction bank loan to expand the capacity of the parking garage. In expanding the garage, we also created a separate mezzanine area for rental cars that allowed USRC to free at the bus deck for buses only. USRC is required to accommodate several parking market segments in the garage due to existing contractual relationships. Part of, our policy, part of what we need to do is make available 600 conveniently located spaces for the retail use. We provide a parking validation program. We allot the developer uh, 75 spaces for rental car parking, establish a free structure that encourages long-term parking and um, that discourages long-term parking and encourages uh, proper turnaround. And these policies coexist with the requirement to make parking available to Amtrak travelers. As for information, level the four of the parking garage, which has a capacity of about 602 cars, normally reaches the capacity by 7.30 in the morning uh, with Amtrak travelers. Not unlike our station retail partner, whom we hear from early, later today, USI, who is attempting to create the right mix of retail vendors with their exciting redevelopment plans for the station, USRC must work to identify the users of the bus deck that will allow the station to maximize its intermodal transportation possibilities. On the bus deck, we work to accommodate the local and out-of-state tour buses, the DC Circulator, Flex Cars, and Ramada. We're in the early discussions with Greyhound concerning their proposed Tennessee at Union Station, the number of bus trips they require, their package express services, 
uh, any boarding waiting area issues, uh, along with security concerns at the station. Greyhound, USI, Amtrak, and USRC all must reach an agreement on the spatula and use issues, as well as the economics of the deal. We have had discussions with the team from the Capital, Capital Visitor Center concerning parking Capitol Hill tour buses at Union Station to help facilitate visitors to the Capitol building. We've also talked about running a shuttle from Union Station to the Hill. At the city's request, we provided in and out services for tour buses that work with the city on a master plan for tour bus parking. We have had early discussions with Ackridge on how best to maximize the use of the bus deck in their proposed Burnham development plans. The, the garage cannot accommodate everyone's needs, so we look forward to the results of the ITC study to help us charter the um, Union Station position as the city's intermodal transportation facility. As noted in my written testimony, the success of Union Station is derived from the Union Station Redevelopment Act of 1981, which was signed in law by President Reagan. Former Chairman of the House on Transportation Infrastructure and former Secretary of Transportation Norman Net Mineta was a sponsor and champion of the bill in the House. Without its efforts, there would have been no Redevelopment Act and there would be no money to complete the parking garage and there would have been not a, re a redevelopment project. The Secretary of Transportation, uh, then uh, Elizabeth Hanford Dole, secured the needed funding from Amtrak and agreed to work with USRC through um, in selecting the developer. USRC is a nonprofit corporation and is governed in, by a board of directors who sets the policies for USRC. The current board consists of the Secretary of Transportation, the President of Amtrak, the Mayor of the City, President of the Federal City Council, and the Federal Railroad Administrator. Um, we are proud of what this intermodal transportation center has done for the Capitol Hill and the city as a whole. And a short list of contributions to the city are, um, we brought commercial and office development to the area, the restoration of the Union Station complex increased neighborhood real estate values, Union Station now accounts for over 5,000 permanent jobs. In 2004, Union Station generated $9.5 million worth in sales tax, uh, two point, in 2005, $9.9 .9 million in sales tax, 2006, 10.6, and in 2007, about $10.7 million in, in um, sales tax for the city. Uh, Union Station is a revenue generator for the city. In closing, uh, I'm compelled to let you all know about the, the proposed threat to the, to, um, the proposed threat by the District of Columbia's possessory interest tax to Washington Union Station and its continued viability. In my written testimony, I provided information that, that uh, I've given before the City Council on, the, um, on our concerns with the PIT. Uh, um, I see my time is up, but at this point, Chairman Norton and members of the committee, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to speak before you today on behalf of Union Station. And I'd be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. very much, uh, uh, Mr. Ball, uh, Mr. Chambers. Good morning, Chairwoman Norton. Excuse me. My name is Bryant Chambers. I am the Assistant General Manager for Jones Lang LaSalle Union Station. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to testify on behalf of them about the management of Union Station in particular. Uh, Union Station is one of the most successful public-private partnerships in the history of the United States. In 1985, the U.S. government, acting through the Secretary of Transportation, leased the property to Union Station Redevelopment Corporation, USRC, a nonprofit District of Columbia corporation formed to redevelop Union Station under a ground lease. In turn, USRC subleased Union Station to Union Station Invesco, LLC, uh, known as USI. In the United States, Jones Lang LaSalle Retail is the largest third-party regional shopping center manager with a 50 million square foot portfolio of more than 100 regional malls, strip centers, power centers, lifestyle centers, ground-up development projects, mixed-use centers, and transportation terminals across 28 states. Jones Lang LaSalle, the only real estate money management and service firm named in Forbes magazine's 400 best big companies for three consecutive years, has a portfolio of 1.2 billion square feet of property under management worldwide, including more than 10,000 retail locations on four continents. In 1986, Jones Lang LaSalle was awarded the development <clears throat> management of Union Station. As a result, over 120 stores, 
restaurants and a cinema were constructed, providing over 213,000 square feet of retail space to Union Station. Today at Union Station, and since the grand opening in 1988, Jones Lang LaSalle has managed the asset for our clients. In 2007, the leasehold interest was purchased by Union Station and Vesco LLC, who retained Jones Lang LaSalle's management services. Our role as a management firm includes client accounting, financial services, skill management, and marketing services. In general, we oversee the, all contracted services at Union Station that include security, cleaning, and repairs and maintenance. Public events at Union Station are coordinated through our office as well. We established annual capital plans for building improvements and repairs throughout the station at, and execute these plans uh, when approved by ownership USI and uh, USRC. In addition, tenant coordination for build outs remodel, and remodels is the responsibility of our management team. Union Station is the national headquarters for Amtrak, as earlier stated, uh, and Amtrak leases 106,200 square feet of office space and 63,800 square feet of operation space for waiting rooms and customer service ticket services. Also, Union Station is the hub for the MARC train, which is the Maryland Rail commuter train, and the VRE, the Virginia Railway Express, and the most heavily traveled stop on the metro system. There are now over 130 merchants in Union Station, the property enjoys high sales performance and is one of the most visited sites in Washington, D.C. Over 32 million visitors pass through Union Station annually. Union Station serves as a venue for special events, including inaugural balls, art exhibits, concerts, and other events that draw patrons to the station. 2007 Union Station restaurant operators and merchants contributed approximately $10,631,100 in sales tax to the District of Columbia. USI, through management agreements and contracts for cleaning and security services, employs approximately 124 employees. Union Station ownership has cooperated with the city on transportation, logistics, and city metro buses will drop off and pick up passengers in front of the Union Station when Columbus Plaza reconfiguration is complete. Also, a bicycle center will be located at the station, and the city will pay no rent for the premises due to the service it provides to citizens and patrons. We actively participate as members of the Capitol Hill Business Improvement District, and the general manager serves on the board of directors as an executive committee member. Union Station is an active member in the Capitol Hill Merchants Association, and Union Station is a member of the Guild of Professional Tour Guides of Washington, D.C. We participate in the annual Ask Me About Washington function in conjunction with the D.C. Chamber of Commerce. We assist the mayor's office working with the D.C. Film Commission to increase awareness of Washington, D.C and Union Station through films such as Along Came a Spider and Wedding Crashers. Union Station is an active member of the Washington Convention and Tourism Corporation, recently rebranded Destination DC, to ensure that millions of regional, domestic, and international tourists know about the cultural diversity and wealth of shopping and dining opportunities the city affords them. Um, at this time, I'm available for any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chambers. Mr. Levy. Chairwoman Norton and the members of the subcommittee, I thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today on behalf of Union Station and Vesco LLC. Relating to the team behind Union Station and Vesco, the operation and management of Union Station, its plans for the future of Union Station, and assessment of the District of Columbia's possessory interest tax on Union Station and its likely effects. Union Station and Vesco LLC an entity of Ben Ashkenazi, was the recent purchaser of the leasehold interest in Union Station. With over 20 years of experience in real estate and as chairman and CEO of Ashkenazi Acquisition Corp, he leads the company's vision. And under his stewardship, the firm has developed into one of the leading real estate investors and operators in the United States. Headquartered in New York City, Ashkenazi Acquisition Corporation is a private real estate investment firm focusing on retail and office assets. With more than 70 properties, AAC has superior performance history in purchasing and managing premier assets. AAC has acquired over 13 million square feet of retail, office, and residential properties located throughout the United States and Canada, some of which have been included in my written testimony. Brian spoke to the specifics of the ownership structure. Uh, so very generally, on January 25, 2007, Union Station and Vesco acquired the leasehold interest from Union Station Venture 2 LLC. Prior to the date of closing, AAC was selected as purchaser by USV and was, an, and was approved by the USRC to acquire the leasehold interest. 
USI leases and operates certain parts of Union Station and in turn has multiple retail sub-subleases with individual owners of over 120 stores and restaurants occupying Union Station, as well as a sub-sublease with Amtrak for offices and railroad opera operations. Jones Lang LaSalle is currently engaged by USI to serve as development manager and property agent. JLL has been involved with Union Station for the past 20 years and has been largely responsible for the re revitalization of Union Station. Union Station is not only a historic landmark, but an architectural gem. One of USI's goals in to, is to enhance the functionality of the, of the station while keeping the original concept of a major intermodal transportation hub. The project will reorganize pedestrian traffic flows to make the station more navigable and ease congestion. Directional signage and information screens will be added throughout the station. Attached is Exhibit A to my written te testimony, and as I will address, are some of the initiatives USI intends to undertake. With the proposed addition of Greyhound Lines, Inc., Union Station will further diversify the transportation options to its visitors. Greyhound queuing would be accessed by a new mezzanine deck directly connected to the parking garage, along with rental cars and other travel services. All Greyhound amenities would be on the same level. The train concourse will be restructured to intuitively streamline the congestion around waiting areas, queue areas, and walkways. In conjunction with the District of Columbia Department of Transportation, a new bicycle transit center will be installed at the west end of the property. The new bicycle center is being built to provide convenience and access to commuters and visitors alike wishing to travel within the city by bicycle. USI and its architects continually work with the USRC, Amtrak, and Ackridge to improve Union Station and for the addition of Burnham Place, which will be developed utilizing the air rights located over the train tracks at Union Station. Additional improvements being undertaken in conjunction with Amtrak and the USRC are the installation of security bollards around the perimeter of the premises. Finally, USI is in agreement with the National Park Service, District of Columbia, and USRC for the enhancements to be made to Columbus Plaza adjacent to Union Station. As part of the overall improvement project, city metro buses will have a convenient location, front and center, for passengers boarding and drop off. As David briefly mentioned in his written testimony, I also feel compelled to briefly discuss and uh, call to your attention the possessory interest tax. The District of Columbia's possessory interest tax legislation is the largest threat to the future, of, future success of Union Station and has the potential to unwind two decades of revitalization. The success of Union Station as an intermodal transportation facility is based on a careful and strategic balance of budgeting for ever-growing costs of maintaining, securing, and operating the century-old national landmark, preserving the crucial tenant mix at Union Station, and the cost to improve Union Station as an intermodal transportation facility. USI has been working with the District of Columbia City Council and has appealed to the Board of Real Property Assessment and Appeals to save Union Station from the inevitable downward spiral it may experience as a result of the PIT assessment. However, fearing the worst and without some kind of relief, it is unlikely that USI will be able to pay that amount together with all of the other increased operating costs, security costs, and improvements that are required to maintain and improve Union, Union Station as an intermodal transportation facility. Chairwoman Norton and the members of the subcommittee, I thank you again for the opportunity to speak before you and would be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, while it's fresh in your mind, let me uh, ask each of you to respond to the testimony of Ms. McCain. Uh, what is your reaction to her testimony? Mr. Ch Mr. Ball. Uh, I'm, I guess basically I'm just embarrassed that we don't have a, a standard policy that people in general understand how to go through the process. I don't think it's a hard policy to identify. I do know over the years we've gone back and forth in terms of what is required for a person to take pictures. After 9-11, we've gone through different iter reiterations of how security should be done, why are people taking pictures. Um, it, it seems like a very simple matter. I talked to Joan Murkowski on the issue. She, she believes that she's given out the right answer. Uh, I'm sorry, who has the... Uh, who Joan, Joan Murkowski, the vice president of, of uh, Jones Langley Sala, the general manager who, who Ms. McCain spoke about, Ms. McCain spoke about in her statement. Um, 
So if you get to the right official, you might be okay. <laughs> yeah, you might be okay. And you know, as in any any building, you know, like I said, there's over 5,000 people that work in the station during the course of business day, and you may get many different answers on, on any issue at a given time. But that's not an uh, that's not an excuse, you know. If there's signs up there that are old or whatever, those signs can be replaced. Um, and and I and I think I've I've talked to Brian. I, I don't think that it's a hard policy to sort of figure out exactly what is what is required. So um, I don't set that policy, but I'm very certain that between Brian and Daniel, they can probably get a clear answer. And each may get on a web page and find out what information you need. So at that point, I'll leave it to these gentlemen. Well, first of all, Mr. Levy. You are counsel, is that right? That's correct. Has this matter ever been the matter of photography, ever been formally presented to you, and what is your legal opinion, sir? It's never been formally presented to me as an issue at So you. what are you there for? Excuse me? What are you there? You're the counsel. Why am I here? You, you are listed as counsel. That's correct. If not to you, then to whom? Are you, are you a lawyer, Mr. Ball? Uh, no, Mr. Morton, I'm not. Are you a lawyer, Mr. Chambers? No, Chairwoman. Mr. Levy. If you're asking for my legal opinion, I can give you my legal opinion. My legal opinion is that, yes, the building is owned by the federal government. However, they conveyed a leasehold interest to Union Station and in turn uh, to, to the USRC, and in turn the USRC conveyed a leasehold interest to us. And, and, uh, so your testimony is that because we leased the building, you may want to finish that sentence. Because the federal government leased, who owns the building, leased it to a private party, fill in the blank, sir. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what you're asking me. Well, you know, I'm You're asking I'm, me whether it's a public uh, or private Mr. building. Mr. Levy, you are the counsel. But you, uh, you say you've never been consulted on this policy. Don't you see the, 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 why, why there is confusion here? I mean, I'd just like to call your attention to the fact that we recently acquired the leasehold interest in Union Station, and there are policies that are being When did developed. you acquire the leasehold? In January of last year. How long have you been uh, counsel? Uh, since about that time. Did you hear Mr. McCain speak of very recent co contradictory guidance and incidents brought to the attention of management, is that enough time for you to have moved forward with a policy? It, it is certainly a problem that needs to be addressed. Mr. Chambers, what Yes, Chairwoman, I'd, I'd actually like to um, address several of the comments that were made in the testimony. I may, um, since I'm the one on the ground, I think I have a little bit more comprehensive information that may make this. Um, we Actually, I was aware of the emails that were being sent back and forth by Mrs. McCann. And it, the, she's correct in stating that there was confusion. And I, I also speak on behalf of IPC security um, that we hired to provide, that, provide the security for the building. She's right in stating that there was confusion and that there were standards that were improperly, um, if not inconsistently enforced throughout the building. Uh, I've actually taken proactive steps to combat those issues in the station. Number one, um, I, I would like to state that I was not aware of her most recent issues that she's had with the Amtrak security. I'm not able to speak on behalf of Amtrak security, but for the purpose of this meeting, that will be followed up. We actually sit, Mr. Ball and I sit on a committee with all the stakeholders in the building. And that and of be course, everybody's on, Amtrak is on the same board. Yes. That is correct. Everybody else. So I will personally follow up the issue with them to make I, sure. I just, that I don't, they're, I'm not trying to. <laughs> now, in. Uh, go ahead. In reference to the standard being unclear, I have actually redrafted the standard, which is why he, he, I'm probably a little bit more qualified to address that, to make it more clear and to make it understood that photography is most certainly welcome inside the building. And that. Mr. Chambers, Ms. Chambers, uh, you, you indicated you were not a lawyer. That is correct. Uh, um, Mr. Levy um, is a lawyer. I'm not sure Mr. Levy would feel competent to draft the policy, and I say this only because this is a public-private facility. I don't know if you are aware of the uh, NLRB cases, but the... Uh, 
but the, the case law is replete with mall cases, for example, where First Amendment rights were upheld in what looked to be entirely private space, sir. Uh, unions being allowed to picket uh, and the First Amendment being cited as well as the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, so so I, I, the reason I bring this to your attention, a, 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 in fact, let me say what I appreciate. See, what I didn't appreciate was reiteration of the policy that, well, we let cameras in here. What's wrong, these, what's wrong with these fools? When, in fact, we continue to get re 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 reports. That's what I didn't appreciate. All I ask, all I ask uh, uh, those who come before us to do is to indicate that they will, in fact, respond uh, accordingly. That's really, I'm not asking you to go through the process here now. So I'm going to ask uh, uh, the three of you together uh, to get at least the outline of a policy. This is a difficult issue, but not nearly as difficult as you think. Uh, get the outlines of the policy for photography uh, in Union Station, where it will be posted. I'm going to ask you to give that to outside counsel, outside, <laughs> meaning somebody who uh, has perhaps practiced before the Supreme Court or before the federal courts and is familiar with the line, of, the unbroken line of cases about one, public access, and two, First Amendment rights. This is a quite special field, and Mr. Levy, I don't expect you, I mean, to be an, an, an expert in every field of law, but I do expect uh, that any legal opinion will exercise a presumption in favor of public access, which, which includes photographers. I'm not even going to get into commercial versus non-commercial types of cameras, because that's so pathetic that, that I don't think it, it, it deserves uh, elaboration. Uh, there are narrow instances, the operative word is narrow, in which you can forbid property in a space leased by the United States government. And if you don't believe me, sue me. But we're not going to sit here and have complaints come back and forth uh, about this, and I ask you to, 30 days, get us the outlines of a policy. Within 60 days, get us a policy. We want to know where the policy will be uh, posted. Uh, and let me move on, because photography was not meant to be uh, the centerpiece of this at all. It's just the, the piece that most indicates that there may be problems at Union Station uh, and that oversight is, is necessary. Mr. Ball. Who is on the ball on the board of the corporation, the uh, managing corporation? Um, for your SRC, it's the Secretary, U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Ms. Peters, President of Amtrak, Mr. Uh, Kumon is on board, uh, Mayor of the City, uh, President of the Federal City Council, represented by Ed, Edmund Cronin, who's uh, President of the Washington Real Estate Investment Trust, and the uh, Federal Railroad Administrator. We have a five board member panel. Five board member. What was that last one? Uh, uh, Minister of the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, Mr. Ball, you have just given the names of, uh, what is it, five people? Yes. Four of whom are public officials. Mr. Levy, I ask you to keep that in mind when you cite the leasehold. The board is governed uh, almost exclusively by public officials. Uh, this legislation, long before I got here, got here reinforcing uh, congressional intent about this facility. We are very appreciative of the public-private nature of this facility. Uh, but, but of course, uh, uh, I think most of us would have difficulty with this um, notice at Union Station uh, that Channel 5 delivered to us. Union Station is private property. Um, the following depicts the rules of conduct for Union Station. Who is responsible for drafting this document, Mr. Levy? Uh, I think it preceded our purchase of Union Station. Have you, when you, when you uh, 
uh, take over a business, you don't look at all their documents, particularly when uh, the business is governed by federal law to see if you're in compliance? We do. However, this isn't your typical shopping mall. There is... This is what? This is not your typical shopping mall or commercial property uh, where you have... All the more reason for you to look closely... I agree. ...at your obligation. I agree. You just heard me list four out of the five members uh, being public officials. Why do you think Congress did that? Mr. Levy, I, 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 the notion that this isn't an ordinary shopping mall, I also commend you to the ordinary shopping malls in which the courts, including the Supreme Court, have said you've got to let people uh, pick it in there and exercise their First Amendment rights in there. So you needn't cite uh, 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 this public-private partnership when the law has even allowed in many circumstances, not all, but many circumstances, the exercise of First Amendment rights in private mall spaces. That is why I say you need outside counsel on this important uh, issue. Um, Mr. All three of you, perhaps, I don't know who can best answer this question. What is the long-term plan for Union Station? Uh, we understand that you are changing the mix of, of, of retail there, uh, that there is, if anything, a wholesale makeover uh, going on. The committee is interested in the details of the makeover. Ms. Norton, I, I will start out. Um, Union Station has probably had the same type of retail in it since it's opened up for the last 20 years. And it's a, custom, it's a customary practice in the um, shopping center business that every, every couple of years, 15, 20 years, you sort of do a, a look at your inventory, look at the type of retail you have, and I'll make it, just say you're absolutely right. And, um, and make it competitive that, with that, what's that going you in the had, market. That the, uh, could I have a, a pad? You're absolutely right that, um, and, and we welcome yeah. anything you might do. You know, so, if you, so if you take a look at what happened, what's happening on 7th Street, or up in Chevy Chase, it's sort of time for remix and uh, to make a different set of, uh, to, to, to revitalize the station a little bit. So um, from some- No, we don't object. You, you understand the basis for my question. Right. I'm, tr I'm asking you for details. Okay. Far from saying it, 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 there should not be changes, okay, well, I'm saying we are unaware of the changes, and therefore I'm asking you for details concerning the changes. Okay, then I'll probably need to let them speak, because I can only paint a broad picture. I mean, I can talk about Union Station as a whole in general. I can talk about the things we're trying to do in terms of the parking garage. The, the leasing responsibility goes over to USI. Our responsibility at USRC is to look at their plans and get them through the Commission of, of Fine Arts. But if you want detailed responses, then I would have to leave that to the developer. Mr. Chambers. Yes, ma'am. Have you any response to the details of the uh, makeover? We actually, uh, as a management company, do not handle the leasing. I'd have to defer to Mr. All Levy. right, let's pass the buck down to Mr. Levy. <laughs> Um, are you asking with respect to tenants or with respect to all types of improvements? Sir, my, I can only ask you a general question because I have no idea what kind of makeover is intended, nor am I objecting to it. Uh, Mr. Ball was exactly right. I'm a native Washingtonian. They can't make over 7th Street fast enough for me. <laughs> so I'm, I, that's not my, my, my issue. In fact, I have no issue. I seek information. Although unfinalized, the idea is to create a state-of-the-art intermodal transportation facility. Um, one of those ideas, and if you look at, I don't know if you have my written testimony before you, but um, the back pamphlet, Exhibit A, will delineate so some of those ideas. Uh, the main grasp of, of the improvements are to improve, improve, the, improve our congestion problem in Union Station, um, make the station more navigable, um, and if you'd like to turn to it, if you have it, I can, you know, I'm happy to go through some of them. Or if you have any specific questions, I can fill them in. If you would summarize, because those are, okay. are, are interesting, and I think, and we're very pleased to have these pictures for the record, but uh, some of these pictures go to things that can only be done when Ackridge and company get in there. And you are undertaking a make makeover now, aren't you? 
Ms. Are you un are you about to change in some ways the existing facility? That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the the the, the, the facility somewhere down the line. I'm, I'm not certain what you may have in your hand now, but but I, I do know that what I've seen so far in the plan shows some grand space in the station, the possibility of working with Amtrak, and because Amtrak has an area. Oh, the new glass storefronts, for example, added to the back mezzanine. Right, those mezzanines, yes, th those are some of the things that they're talking about. Possibly, will possibly, that bring more retail, more stores? It would actually will help circulation more so. It's, it's not so much about getting more square footage, it's about having people move from one part of the building to another. Currently, you can do that before. Well, uh, Ackridge, is, Ackridge is a separate but he, that's connected the air issue. Rights. And, and their, their work is what their work is. We can still move in the station independently of their work, but we have talked them because it would be some place where there can be a, an opportunity to have a joint connection between the two. Between well, you, the two ha you have at the bottom uh, Ask Mr. Ashkenazi, I mean the Ashkenazi uh, Corporation. Please forgive me. I think I've called you several different kinds, the corporation several different kinds of things. Uh, the um, it says lower level looking up to street level, new re retail <coughs> spaces replace existing movie theaters. So right, well, the movie theaters are basically losing money. Uh, they don't work in Union Station. For themselves or for the? Well, for, for the stations in general, they don't pull the same type of crowd because they don't pull the same type of crowd. You don't have the same number of people shopping in the stores. So, so you're it's not, we're not going to have to go to the movies at Union Station anymore. I just, I, that, I, that I have well, no federal well, jurisdiction over. But, but I'm a native Washingtonian. I don't go there often either to the movies. Well, I do go because you know, I live on Capitol Hill. Yeah. So you, you don't intend to have other moving, you're going to have other retail there? I, I think for the, the developer, they're actually trying to figure out what is the best mix, what actually works at Union Station. How do you bring people back right, to Union who's Station? Doing? You have a consultant doing that, sir? Uh, I don't have a consultant. Again, that's the USI folks that have the retail who? responsibility. At the Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi well, Mr. Levy again. Mr. Levy, who's yes. Doing, yes. doing this work? What's that? Who's, who, uh, obviously you're doing some kind of market survey. That's right, and, and we do that in-house. That, that's what our business is, to evaluate. So what have you determined thus far? Um, well, thus far, uh, what David spoke about, the theaters um, are underutilized, and-, and So what I, kind of retail you think, for example, in the basement might increase the utilization? I, I don't think the idea is to replace the tenant. I think, w obviously, working with the Commission of Fine Arts, is to create a walkway that would allow more light into our food court and maybe upgrade the food court and make it more inviting than it is right now. So you, so you do anticipate food courts, uh, food down where you have food now? Yeah, I mean, we do we, yeah, we do anticipate having that food court. The only change there would perhaps be creating a walkway downstairs under the center cafe. But um, the movie theaters wouldn't be there, so what would replace the movie theaters? Stairways a walkway downstairs. Oh, goodness. So you mean you're willing to give up whatever uh, whatever uh, uh, attraction they have and to simply replace it with infrastructure? Because uh, the, the, the plus side after creating that kind of traffic may encourage our retailers and our, and our food courts and... Mm -hmm. Well, you, it's, it's your business, so you must know what you're doing. You're gonna have, but uh, you're gonna have the, the same food courts down there. Uh, perhaps. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the ranking member. Thank you. Uh, I'll, uh, I have a few questions, and then uh, you may have additional uh, questions you seek answers for. Um, let me just. Uh, get in time and space on the redevelopment project. Um, everything is in place to move forward with the additional uh, development, the three million square feet. Is that correct? Uh, would Mr. Levy or Mr. Ball? No, th no? Th that's, a, that's, a, that's a completely different project. That, that, what I believe you're referring to is the Ackridge Park. Okay, where, where is that? That's over top of the air rights. That's between the Union Station parking no, garage and the SEC building. Is everything building. On pla in place for that? I couldn't answer that question. That's, that's, that, that would be, you're not involved. No. You're just yeah. involved in the current management. Correct. Right. You have nothing and, to and, do. And, and th these are actually physically separated parcels right. that, that the developers have to work together to figure out how best to connect in certain areas how best to get the right synergy between the two projects. So 
um, they're, they're separate entities, but we do communicate with, with the developer partners. It, it's going to be part and parcel, though, to the existing station? It will be connected because we've negotiated access between the two properties, so they will have a connection. Or is that the property station. that would have the Greyhound facility? Currently, Greyhound has had discussions with USRC as well as USI. Greyhound would like their presence to be inside of Union Station. The Ashkenazi group has taken a look and has identified the possibility of creating a mezzanine space in what is Amtrak's current waiting area, a mezzanine space above the Amtrak's waiting area to, to, to house a Greyhound ticket counter in there. Greyhound so it's not in the, then this, this new 3 million square foot addition, or is it? Well, would it be? We, 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 we don't know. It, that's the best answer, yeah. I mean, we, we've identified the possibility of it being within Union Station. Again, you know, they can park buses in the, in the USR or in the Union Station parking garage. They could have possibly have a ticket counter within the yeah. station. I and can imagine a three million square foot addition to not be interconnected to the current Amtrak facility. You, but you're saying it, 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 it's, there will be that connection, right? They're, they're separate entities, correct, yeah. But I know that, but the it's question It's about almost like if, you have, if you're in a city block and you have two office buildings side right. by side, they may have a connected atrium, they, they may not. At, at this point, I think the plans are somewhat still fluid, and both developers, the average developer as well as the Ashkenazi developer have talked, and there are some possibilities for connection. Uh, uh, the Amtrak, uh, project to be interconnected with the new project, wouldn't that be a benefit to both? I, it, I'm not a developer. Yes, it could be. My, pardon? Yeah. Yes, it could be. Well, the, 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 some deals with, in terms of when you take a look at the property, some of the elevations don't line up. There's different elevations in terms of where access points are, uh, physical impediments in, inside. So those, those are some engineering details that really need to be taken a look at in concept. Everything seems very good. Well, again, to me, it would. It, uh, the airspace is being is the air, who's who's granting the airspace uh, lease? Is that you all or the f federal government or who? Amtrak. Federal government, if if I understand your question right, the Anchorage has purchased the air rights from the federal government. Yeah. Well, see, I, I can't imagine anyone allowing a development of that not to be. Um, accessible and uh, I mean there is to your, to your existing there is a connection between the Anchorage airspace and the Union Station uh, project. Okay. Well, again, it just uh, to me uh, in our interest. I mean, we it and we're we're giving uh, if the federal government has title to this property why you wouldn't have uh, a new three million square foot complex uh inter interconnected or inter accessible that would make accessible, yeah. accessible uh to both uh, i just can't imagine that but uh, i guess every day you get surprised around here um The improvements that you were talking about at Union Station, first of all, okay, uh, you're operating the station, right, Levy? Well, yes, yeah. we're managing an operation managing. along with JLL. Okay. And the corporation still owns it, and uh, they're, they're the, the people that are actually doing the administration of the leases, et cetera, That's deciding right. future uses. Um, and the, the current... Union Station Development Corporation. Do they are they showing a, a profit or a, a annual? What what what's their bottom line at the end of the last few years? For USRC as, as a nonprofit corporation. I know, but you you well, have either uh, make, money mo make money or you lose money. No, we we make money by the lease structure. You do. Yes, we do. And you're pouring. Is that the money you're pouring back into these improvements that have been described that the chair? Uh, showed uh, for new uh, ticket counters, for the bike racks, for the uh, food courts. Are you pouring that money back in? Or no, no, we are not. I mean, the way the lease is structured. They do it. 
Yes, they do. We have some, we have some capital responsibilities as USRC. We have the responsibilities to make certain that the historical integrity building is okay. maintained. So you're doing the bike stuff and all no, of that. The, the bike and stuff has been done by the District of Columbia government with, with some financial support by USRC. Uh, I'm, I'm a uh, has-been developer, but I looked at your bike racks there, and uh, it looks like a nice, con I can't tell whether that's glass or some sort of awning cover. It, it's glass enclosed. Yeah, that'll look like crap in a little while, so <laughs> I'd go back and uh, you have a historic building and some, if you're gonna build a bike rack, build something that goes with the building that doesn't look like a, it's gonna look like a dust bin, uh, uh, forget, well, just again, uh, I think you could do something a little bit more conducive to the space. Uh, the um, oh, food courts, food courts. Uh, anybody here eaten down in the food courts lately? I okay. Let me tell you my last experience. I went down to the food court. I had I was going to catch I think a train. I got there. I got there real early. So I got down and have some lunch in the food court rather than eat off. I would say I got panhandled at least four times downstairs. The food was pretty good. It was one of those. They were too busy with photographers. Panhandle. Um, now, if they'd stop harassing the photographers and get a little bit of order. I mean, I even offered to buy the people lunch. They didn't want, they just want the cash because they're going to go buy drugs or whatever. Uh, but. Uh, like you, you guys run the place, uh, stop the panhandlers down uh, you, you where know, people are trying to, what? I mean, that, that's a very serious point you just I'm telling you, I remember Congress no. sitting there, and, they panhandled um, the living hell out of me. I haven't been back since because it was an unpleasant you know, experience. We, we, we work on that, and that's just, is, that's even tougher than the, what? that's an even tougher issue than the photographer. Oh, well, then, then. Yeah, just in terms of... Why, why is it tough? I'm sorry. Uh, 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 no, no, I uh, yield. No, just in terms of um, they, the panhandlers, are also citizens, you know, and, you you know, it's, it's a delicate issue just to work to, to work with them in terms of, um, you know, you just can't kick them, kick them out. That's, that's well, not allowed. Uh, I'd well, wait a minute. You can kick photographers out. Excuse me. Yeah, but you, you can't, can't <laughs> kick fan manners out. You know, I can understand. Yeah, I, I, I follow you. Yeah. I'll stop. <laughs> uh, 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 I'll go back to the. Uh, I'll, I'll go back to the ranking member in a yeah. second. But I have yeah. to. I have to make the distinction. <laughs> Mr. Levy is very quick to cite to me the private facility uh, notion, um, but when it comes to panhandlers on this quote private facility. <laughs> Uh, then, of course, you have problems uh, kicking them uh, out. And I must say, uh, at, at, with some risk to your own bottom line, since you, you don't get Mr. Uh, Micah going again, the, the distinction is this. In the streets of D.C., we cannot stop people from panhandling. That's entirely public. Uh, I just want to know if your answer to the to the ranking member is that you don't have the legal authority to do so, or you haven't figured out how to do it. Which, um, you know, I, I, go ahead. as far as just to take you through the procedure, because this is an ongoing issue that we have inside the station, where our security will address. You know, we we do prohibit panhandling, as you called it, solicitation inside the building. The challenge that we face is our security firm does not have arresting powers. Not that you can necessarily arrest somebody for doing such, but we reprimand an individual for soliciting, tell them to stop. I've we got can... a suggestion for you. Now, anyone who's been on Capitol Hill, if you go over here to, is it first and see in front of the Capitol Hill Club where you come up out of the metro station? You know where that intersection is? Correct. There's an officer there, his name is Officer Thompson. And anybody who's familiar with the Capitol Hill, you don't jaywalk at that corner, you don't uh, get out of order in any way because Officer, Th you do not even cross when the light is, is 
uh, doesn't have a little people sign on it because Officer Thompson enforces the law very strictly. He's got, I heard he's going to retire uh, the end of this year. You ought to sure as hell interview him about going over to Union Station and enforcing some of the rules for folks that are trying to have a... D would you take your family there? I mean, I, I have. I won't even go back because of the harassment I experienced. Uh, you're talking about shedding a little light on Union Station. I'm talking about just getting some order. In fact, maybe you could have a bus service, bring them over and take them down to the cafeteria here in the Hart Building and let them panhandle among the members of Congress and the staff that eat in the Rayburn Cafeteria. <laughs> I've got a whole host of suggestions that we can... But again, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm busting your chops a bit, but <laughs> I, I really would like to see the place succeed. It, it, is, it has succeeded well. Uh, the same thing, I guess, probably happened with the movie theaters. I'd never go to a movie theater because of the harassment uh, there. It's, that's more along the lines of just other opportunities yeah, yeah, to, well, to go in the city and better theaters, quite but frankly. But still, still... And uh, it's maybe it's difficult because it's down in the. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you go to any theater we, nowadays with the stadium yeah. seating, it's not something that is doable within our premises. Well, the other thing I, I can't but ha express enough uh, encouragement for, again, uh, co locating all transit, including the private uh, carriers, uh, in, in any reconfiguration, whether it's a new extended facility that's connected adjacently or the existing facility if there's a re, uh, rehab. So just a couple of points and a little bit of harassment. I'll yield back. Thank you very much uh, for that um, real life example. I haven't had quite that experience. Um, Could I invite you to lunch over there sometime? <laughs> I'll, I'm serious. I'll take you down there. We'll do it. Oh, we'll I'll tell ahead. them when we're coming, but we'll have and then I'll get that photographer wherever she is. She can come and take a picture of us, <laughs> and, and then our friends that we acquired uh, to panhandle. Thank you. Well, we're having a little fun at your expense, but we we sit here also to assist you and to help you in any way you want to. I must say, uh, Mr. Chambers, when I heard you say you had no arrest power, that's right because security guards don't have arrest power. I couldn't help but think about the photographers who were threatened with arrest by your security guards. Uh, the, couldn't help but think of that example. Yes, ma'am. As you gave as the excuse for not getting panhandlers off. Let me be clear. We were not suggesting that people who are hungry um, uh, be arrested. That Correct. was not what we had in mind. Um, Normally, there, what this kind of problem, because you say it's been a chronic problem, for the, would, for the cause a, would cause a corporation to do would be to, to get some advice from people who uh, know something about homeless people and about how to proceed. We do. We actually so you have, have a chronic problem. Who's your advice come from, sir? We actually have help from the Capitol Hill bid. They actually have a homeless ambassador who deal specifically with these folks. And they advise us. They also advise uh, the members that are homeless where they can find uh, shelter, where you they need, can find food. You need somebody who has, uh, these people feed people. And, Correct. And we love it that they feed people. That's not the kind of, of advice you need. You need advice about how to, to in fact, uh, get panhandlers off the property short of arrest. I recognize about the limits of arrest, and I wish you wouldn't cite uh, or would tell your security guards that they don't have arrest power. You bother me with your security guards because somebody's going to sue this corporation, Mr. Levy, for the way in which these security guards are, are performing. Who is in charge of training security guards at Union Station. It's actually the training is handled internally so who, by, by the company that we hire. They actually have a training program that they go through. It's required by their corporation, well, IPC. It, uh, have you had enough evidence here today that your security guards are poorly trained? I, have I you think had it merits discussion with IPC, and we're going to have a discussion with them. As, and we have had the yeah. Well, uh, I'm asking you to submit within 30 days a plan for retraining 
each and every security guard now at Union Station and for indicating what the training program will be for new security guards. I suggest you get an outside consultant who knows something about how to train security guards. We don't want, after this hearing, we expect these problems to go away. Uh, let, me, let me ask, um, uh, let, 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 let me ask uh, this question. Um, we, I, I was asking about the makeover uh, and an understanding that just as we applauded the arrival of businesses, you would want to look again, but it looks like basically you don't, you're doing changes in infrastructure. Are you planning to change any of the uh, uh, tenants who are there, uh, particularly the long-term tenants? No plans have been finalized. We're, we're still in the midst of coming up with that final plan. And, uh, you know, I don't want to kind of divert attention, but we are dealing with the possessory interest tax right now, which can be determinative of what our future plans are. It, what can be determinative? The possessory interest tax. Uh, what, will, what, does, what does that have to do with tenancy of people who've been there for some period of time? because we have to have enough money to run the station. Well, you and mean the people who've been there for some period of time won't pay what it takes uh, in, 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 in as part of their leases? I don't understand that. Well, in determining... I, I mean, we're not getting... Are, into are the you asking... We are not getting into the business of the District of Columbia here. So you can put that aside. We don't overturn what the District of Columbia does. And I'm asking you a question that has nothing to do with that. I'm simply trying to find out... Uh, what is your policy with respect to long-term tenants? And my answer is that it's still being finalized. We, we still haven't come up with the final plan as to the long-term leasing goals of Union Station. Uh, Mr. Levy, uh, a, I have received a letter from a colleague uh, that he sent on June 16th writing on behalf of B. Smith's Restaurant. This is well-known restaurant uh, located in Union Station for some years, um, and other members of the Congressional Black Caucus approached me with respect to B. Smith in particular. Um, the concern was, you can lease to who you want to, we understand that, but the concern was that if you have a business and you see a makeover going on, the absence of notice with no opportunity to prepare uh, for possible relocation uh, would be uh, not in the interest of, of any, anybody concerned. It would be very poor business practice. That's why I'm asking you, and, and you told me you didn't expect big changes in the basement. Do you expect big changes um, in anywhere else in the restaurant, because by not even responding to letters, you did not respond, uh, Mr. Ashkenazi did not respond to a letter of uh, June 16th from um, uh, Congress member um, Elijah Cummings, who has brought this matter to the attention of the 43-member Congressional Black Caucus. So it just escalated simply because there's no response there was a, a, a there was a July 16th. What what, what date is this? Um, a letter from Alan Sills to B Smith Restaurant. Um, letters were followed up with several telephone calls. Um, would you tell us whether those phone calls have helped? Uh, this particular uh, restaurant to understand um, how it should proceed? I, I can tell you what our ordinary, ordinary course of business is. Uh, we frequently, frequently receive requests. I believe that was a request for a renewal. I, I, is that correct? Renewal of lease? I, I, I'm not even aware. I suppose so. If you was going to move. I, if I don't have it in front of me, so I'll, I'll just assume that that's what it is. And um, I know that our company... Extension of their lease currently right. ends in 2009. It, May 31st, 2009. For an additional term. 
and, and we frequently get those types of requests, and they're, or, they're answered in the ordinary course of business. Well, this wasn't answered in the ordinary course well, of business. And we I'm typically saying don't it, negotiate. This is 2008, and it's almost gone. I, I understand. It's a major restaurant. If it's going to have to move, uh, don't you think they deserve some notice? How much notice do you think they should have? Well, I can tell you for certain that we'll give them whatever notice they're entitled to under their lease and whatever notice we can provide them outside of their lease. I, I know that it's not only our practice, that it is common Do the movie estate. theaters have notice that they will not, no longer be in the building? Excuse me? Those plans are not finalized, ma'am. But you just told me about them. It, it, they're things that we're working on in order... Well, just a moment. We just future. heard... <laughs> Excuse me? We just heard that you, you, you do not intend to have movie theaters there. I'm, I'm simply raising questions for fair notice to people who do business uh, under your management. Right. And frankly, it reflects on the government of the United States if, in fact, people are not treated with normal business practice. And, and, I believe and so I'm trying to find treated. out, since I now know that the movie theaters won't be there, they don't even know it. What's that? You just said we're, we weren't sure whether the movie theaters would be there, but we just heard testimony that... Because the plans haven't been finalized. We can't tell them that they're not going to be there. Perhaps we will renew their lease. I, would, I would hate think, to tell them that Don't you moving. think you ought to have a meeting with the tenants? Mr. Ball, uh, you all may be confused about who's responsible, but do know that this committee is going to hold uh, that public corporation responsible. Don't you think that you'd want to meet with... Um, the tenants or instruct Mr. Levy and company to meet with the tenants in order to keep members of Congress from having to intervene into your affairs as I'm having to do with respect to a private matter that normally would not be any concern of mine? Yes, Madam Chairman. We'll, would, we'll you, would you conduct a meeting of you, you, the corporation, a meeting of all the tenants so that they can have some understanding of what is occurring and would you have someone from the managing corporation there so at least people can have their questions answered so far as they can be i'll be glad to take you see challenge. there has been contradictory testimony here today about how we're going to open it up and there won't be movie theaters but yeah we haven't really made that decision yet that is very poor business practice and so I'm going to ask within 30 days there be a meeting of all the tenants where all of you all are there and, indica and indicate to them with the greatest clarity you can what your intentions are to the extent that you have not, uh, 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 which is the, the easy throwaway answer, decided, tell them when you expect to decide. These people are in business just like you are, Mr. Levy. Uh, Mr. Ball. Yeah, to answer your question, yes. Are you aware, or surely you are aware, of the uh, policy of the United States government with, expect, with respect to small business and disadvantaged businesses, minority businesses, women-owned businesses, and the like? Yes, yes, we are. Um, yes. Uh, how many such businesses are there in Union Station? I think the last count, and you might count, I think it's maybe 40 or 55 small disadvantaged businesses. I don't have the exact account, but we're talking about the- Most of them would be small businesses yeah. by definition. How many are minority-owned or female-owned businesses? I think the number rests between 40 and 50. Well, and, the and number I'm, reported to us is less than half a dozen. Now, you need, Mr. Levy, do you have better figures? Maybe, maybe it's 40 to 50. Yeah, Maybe I mean, it's half a dozen. As of the end of the fourth quarter of 07, uh, I believe there were approximately 54. So I, I don't know what... 54 minority and women-owned or women-owned businesses. That's correct. Give me examples. Uh, I'm going to defer to... Um, I'm just not all that familiar with the actual tenants there. So I'm going to defer to uh, Bryant just to kind of confirm because it's from the end of the quarter. Uh, some of the tenants we have listed here, uh, Aurea uh, is minority owned. Um, so you're confirming 54? Uh, 
Oh, I'm, I'm looking. I don't, I, you don't have to read the it, role. It, it's as the fourth I'm, quarter. I'm I, I just sure don't have an update right. report with me. Was, was there an outreach? I'm trying to make sure what is that how is you Is that how you brought, made sure you were in compliance with federal law on this matter? You reached out and, and brought in uh, those tenants. Is Mr. Levy and Ashkenazi uh, aware that that is the policy of the United States government, Mr. Ball? Yes, we've, we've had discussion with it. We've had, I've had discussion with them on, on that issue. In the makeover, uh, and, and, in the makeover Mr. Levy, are you aware that that, that policy will be, uh, that that is the policy of the federal government? Absolutely. Um, would, now, with this troika here, I'm not, I, I want to make sure I assign the right person. Uh, Mr. Levy, I guess, is the, uh, I'm, I'm going to get uh, Ms. Norton, submitted what, what? within 30 days. Give me my, I want to make sure I have it matted. It was in here. It goes all the way up to the basically chamber. The basic amendment of the statute. So chamber should be on one day. Okay. Mr. Chang, you, you, you're, you're the direct manager of the property. Yes, third party. Submit to me names and of the minority and women-owned businesses in Union Station and uh, whatever evidence you have that they are in fact minority or women-owned. Just need to know that because the, we've got this, uh, we ha the, 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 uh, we've got this conflicting, um, and it's a very good time to look at it anyway if there's gonna be new, new things at, at Union Station. Okay. Um, Buses. Mr. Ball, are you aware of the intermodal mandate of the United States Congress uh, for Union Station? Uh, not a... No. I have some knowledge of intermodal. I, I know we do, but what you spoke about directly, I don't have direct knowledge of it. Well, maybe that, that's makes me want to cry. Uh, so you are not aware that Congress, uh, ever since 67 when NCPC, uh, National Capital Planning Commission, recommended to Congress that Union Station be made an intermodal facility. No, I'm, we I'm, have been embarking on that. I mean, that's, that's what we work to. If you're asking about a specific bill or something, I, I can't. No, call I, it, I, but, I never oh. ask. Well, I never uh, ask about bills. Okay. I'm asking, are you aware of the congressional mandate that Union Station become a true intermodal facility. Yes. Are you aware that it is not that now or anything close to it? I know. The fact that you put by um, dent of where the subway stops and where the bus stops, a number of things in the same location, an intermodal center does not make. Um, let me proceed with a detail then. Uh, Mr. Ball, I, I believe you gave rather short shrift, at least in the letter to me, uh, about a proposal of a quite reputable uh, intercity, intercity bus company to sublease uh, a spaces that were available uh, in Union Station. Here's another matter that comes to the Congress that Congress has delegated to you, sir, and to the public officials that sit with you. And these people were told that there was something, that their business practice of not going through the right process. Um, there was no indication of what process they should have used in order to give the people of this region access to low-cost um, bus travel in Union Station and to take these buses uh, off our streets or at least keep them from discharging people on the streets of the nation's capital for want of a place to leave them, notwithstanding the fact that the Congress of the United States 
for 40 years has mandated an intermodal facility at Union Station. Why was either a sublease or some other way for this bus company uh, to be located at Union Station, why was it refused? Um, on that issue, Ms. Norton, the company never even approached USRC on that issue. But they that, approach, but, but, when, I, when I'm going to sublease, I approach the people who's holding the lease. And, now, and, and if they never approached you, why didn't you say we'd be pleased to deal with them because we know that Congress means bus uh, service to be in this facility? It probably would have been the best answer. At this point, we'll look at our policy and I'll work with the district to see how we can accommodate the, these types of buses that you mentioned. I appreciate that, Mr. Ball. Within 30 days, I ask you to be in touch with those bus companies to indicate that you are considering uh, the access possibilities of those bus companies. This is extremely troubling to this member of Congress. Uh, in my opening statement, I, I said that people are almost hitching a ride on anything they can find because of the gas prices. Um, the, the notion that we're sitting here with an intermodal mandate and you're telling somebody you used the wrong procedure. Who told you it was the wrong procedure to sublease from the person who holds the lease? Did you, in fact, where does it say that in the lease of, was it Greyhound? No, actually, I didn't know that Megabus was coming to Union Station until I saw them on a web page a website that said what the services are going to be. So we had no idea. We had no so once you saw they were coming to drop people off because they had a valid sublease, uh, you, you then decided that that lease could not be recognized because you hadn't approved it? They never had, they never had contacted us. We had no lease. We had no business co communication whatsoever, Ms. Norton, none. It's, it's like they had communication or were in the process of engaging in communication with the leaseholder, Mr. Chambers, uh, are you aware that Megabus was turned away? I am not. What is the policy? Is the policy does the policy remain what it was the, that you can't sublease from someone who holds a valid lease to a to 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 uh, spots at Union Station? Is that the policy? I mean, just one, one item, the, the garage lease is separate than, than the station lease. The garage lease, we have 100% jurisdiction over what happens in the parking garage. That's being USRC. In the station, they do the retail leasing with, within the station. So if you ask a right. question now, about the bus, you get past was, the jurisdictional, I ask Mr. Chambers, okay. and you all don't play those games with me. I'm holding right. you, Mr. Ball. And, and, and well, the I, Congress of the United States is responsible for every question I ask. You may want to delegate these people and make sure they do their job, but four out of five people from there are us. Correct. And therefore, I want to know what the policy is going to be on. You, are, you already told me you would open the policy, then you turn to, to, to uh, the right. management. So passing the buck won't work no, before no, this no, subcommittee. No, I, I didn't pass the buck. I'm saying clearly in the parking garage. Well, whose responsibility was it? In you the, answered the letter, Mr. Mr. Ball. In the parking garage, it's USRC's responsibility. Huh? Union Station Redevelopment Corporation's responsibility. It's my responsibility in the parking garage. What, what responsibility do you have, Mr. Chambers, since you apparently have to do with the bus? No, uh, for the parking bus? garage, we have none. And we also do not Who have Who has leasing. responsibility for the park? I do. For the parking garage, is USRC. Yes. Well, what was that? You know what? Uh, 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 this committee has not in the past done what my other committees uh, do, which is to swear people. Any testimony you give I, has automatically been taken to be true, but obviously that wasn't true because you then turned to, to, to others to your right or I'm left. I'm sorry, you must have misunderstood my, my answer. If you can ask me again, I'll ask it to the best of my ability. You asked me about who controls the parking garage. That's my office, Union Station Redevelopment Corporation. We control the policy. Why, the did the, why did the corporation, through your letter, respond that subleases could not be granted? Was there a legal basis for your response? Yes. Had you informed the leaseholder 
that that would be the case. What was the policy reason for that response? The policy reason be because we, the, the, the mega bus instance should have come to our office in terms of creating. So why did you not instruct them to come to your office so that you could then uh, consider the matter yourself? I made a mistake. That's all right then. Um, all I ask is within 30 days be in touch with them. I'm not instructing you to lease to them. In fact, who holds a lease, please? I don't know why this bus company uh, wants to lease uh, or sublease, but I ask two things. One, one, be in touch, and two, submit to this, this committee within 30 days what the sublease policy is. And if your policy is no subleases, you better have a very good reason why. I can understand why in the public interest you would want to have some approval and some, some say so ultimately, if that is your view. This was a flat turndown with no indication uh, as to why. And I do not know whether it's orally or in writing that competition with Greyhound was cited. Or Amtrak or something. <laughs> the reason that sticks in my mind is that competition is precisely what the Congress of the United States is trying to promote a union station. That's the whole point, to say that when you go there, based on your means and your wishes, you can travel any way and no way will be denied to you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, Mr. Bo how often does this corporation meet? I mean, I, the board of directors. Uh, this year, we probably met at least three times this year. And this, we're in, what, the seventh month now? Well, yeah. uh, Mr. Ball, I, I also ask you to brief uh, the board or their representatives because um, this committee wants to see some form of bus service in Union Station by the end of this year or be presented with a very good policy reason why not. I mean, good policy reasons are, you know, security, not reputable company. By the way, before we write on behalf of a company, we, th we investigate to make sure that we're dealing with a company that, in fact, um, is one we should be writing for. I tell you one thing, I don't think these people would want to sublease to somebody who wouldn't pay their rent. This was a very reputable, this one was. I don't, I, there may be others. A and pr perhaps what you should do is a, is, 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 is a, a competition, but this would not have required that because it was a sublease. So be on notice. Um, when it comes to subleases, I don't know why that couldn't be done for, uh, till the, uh, by the end of this year. And, th and I want to know, how many bus spots are not being used at Union Station on a regular or daily basis? Yeah, is that a question we're answered now? Yes, sir. OK. Uh, like I said, I think in my written testimony, we, we park maybe 12,000 buses a year in Union Station between March and end of June, we're probably at 100% occupancy all the time from the garage, let's say 9 in the morning. This is very important. Okay. At 100% occupancy, people pa parking, what, for, by the day, by uh, the hour? A, a well, buses come in probably between like 10 in the morning until probably about 3 in the afternoon, and they pick back up from maybe like 5 to 6. So they come to Union Station to let off people and do they leave? They park. In most cases, they do park their buses at Union. The entire time? The entire time. How much does that cost? Uh, $20 between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. $10 between 7 p.m. and uh, 7 a.m. And if they want a reserve spot held, it's $50 for, for a reserve spot. Uh, when you say you're always full, I must say I, I, I <laughs> But But again, again, I'm really talking about that this period, what you call our spring period, DC's tour period from between like March and June. We're very packed, and then it picks up again between, let's say, September and November. We pick back up again where the bus is coming on, on a very frequent, very frequent um, process. Um, other times, we aren't that busy. Um, and so what, what we're really looking for is to how to maximize the use in the bus space, 
we're looking forward to the information which comes out from the ITC study just in terms of the different uses for the station. We look towards um, what Congress is doing in terms of the Capitol Hill Visitor Center because we get conversation from the Capitol Visitor Center in terms about their need to park tour buses here. We've talked. Well, I can tell you right now, Mr. Ball, that plan is dead. We're not because the plan was to somehow have the buses parked there and <laughs> then pay a dollar to get to the Congress of the United States. That plan went up in smoke. Uh, and I've already had discussions with the sergeant at arms. Uh, that's just not your fault. This has nothing to do with you. Uh, but what killed it was that somehow uh, buses which now <laughs> come here about from Botanic Gardens leave and then go someplace. The district has yet to provide any place for them to, to really go. Uh, th that people who get dropped off for free uh, would, then, would then be sent to Union Station. Um, we don't mind them coming to Union Station. We're pleased about that. But uh, we've been assured, and I speak now for myself, for the Appropriations uh, Subcommittee, that uh, the Botanic Gardens route has also to remain there. And see, that's the kind of planning that has to go on. Uh, but that's something that was not within your entire sphere. And we have also been, think we have come to a way where, where um, the, uh, the district's uh, own um, line that it runs can, in fact, still be useful without uh, being completely <laughs> taken off uh, uh, the... Uh, the line by the Congress of the United States it was the extra cost. It wasn't anything about Union Station, but the city couldn't tell us how many spaces it, it was. It, 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 and we were complete. We were very concerned uh, by um, the fact that there is uh, how this would work with a bottleneck. You know, the framers did that. The bottleneck that the circle establishes, and having, having uh, what they conceived of as a lot more tour buses uh, to come up there. Right as we understand it, there will be some renovations on the outside of Union Station. Columbus Plaza gets redone. That's a project between USRC, National Park Service, and the District of Columbia Department of Transportation. So that there are a lot of things in the hopper and just in terms of how it works out. We, we're when is that, that construction uh, going to begin? Whenever we get through NCPC and Commission of Foreign Arts, that construction should begin. We're, we're trying to get Do you have the money already for that construction? Uh, USRC is doing a 20% match. The District of Columbia government does have the money, I think, from the Federal Highway. Well, I, I, I live on Capitol Hill. I avoid, <laughs> even in non-rush hours, I avoid that circle. I can't imagine why anybody in the transportation business would want to put uh, more buses up there, and we're not going to do it. But I, I need to know what your policy is and how you plan for buses to come and go in light of our interest in inner city bus service. That's largely my, my concern and interest because I have no problem with tour buses coming up there now. You may have to think this through once you get to the construction phase. And indeed, in that regard, um, there's an unfinished entrance uh, at Union Station that would allow more direct access from H Street. And we understand that there were, there were, you know, it required $2 million more, but then there was some uh, problem with obtaining indemnification from Amtrak. I'm so confused by that. I ha if that's all that's standing in the way, and particularly given how that would relieve some of the traffic around the circle, I have to ask you, what is the problem with indemnification from Am Amtrak for one of a $2 million uh, uh, upgrade that would allow the unfinished uh, entrance um, more directly from First and Eighth Street? I'm not familiar with that issue. I, I do know Who would be, sir? Who would be? I, I've never heard that. I've never heard that, so I, I don't know. But, but I do know... This is a tunnel that was never completed. Um, 
Union Station plus. Uh, oh, that's the pedestrian tunnel. That that would not accommodate. If, if we're referring to the same that runs parallel to First Street. In a, in a the, the, well, let me indicate okay. the Union Station Plaza Associates, whoever that is, um, has an office building near First and Eighth Street. They have proposed completing the tunnel for approximately two million dollars. That, 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 that would be a pedestrian access, and, and that, that would go from the north end of the Union Station Metro stop down to the existing H Street underpass. So that's that about would be very useful because people could at least be dropped off there by foot on foot. I, again, this goes to whether you are thinking through the intermodal. No, and, and we, we, we talk about many, many of those issues, and, and I didn't realize that's what you were calling by. So that, that has one item that, we've been, that has been looked at. I, I, um, all right, let, let just, I just want to get your, your, your final testimony on that. Um, the indemnification from Amtrak issue is what apparently stopped the tunnel from going forward initially, because it was always planned and would already be there. Are you aware of what that issue is? I'm not aware of what the issue is. All right. Have Amtrak within 30 days submit to us what that issue is so that we can understand that. Um, is there a different security policy for retail, for Mr. Levy, for Amtrak, for the parking garage. Who is in charge? Who is the master um, security czar who sees that security intersects? Because as you indicate, there are different kinds of, of, of entities there. there. There is no czar, Chairwoman. There actually are different entities. You've got the Amtrak side of the house, which has houses Amtrak security and also Amtrak police. Uh, you've got our management firm um, with the approval of USI that hires IPC security to provide customer service and public safety just in the common area spaces. That's Ryan, let me, there, there's one umbrella. We have what's called the Station Action Team, where Union Station Redevelopment Corporation, Amtrak, and the station developer all meet and figure out security in the building, understand the conditions which go in the building every day. If there's a fire alarm which goes off, all three entities meet if there's a problem in the station. So those things are discussed. So there's one umbrella arm. Because they are under one roof, after all. Yes, right. yes, And is. we're all chairs on that. Yes. So. Uh, w is that in writing? Yes, this, yes it is. Well, I, I asked you. I was not in my written testimony, but, but we do have a. Uh, Excuse me? We, we do have a, a written. Uh, station action. Yeah, we can, we can provide you with, with a copy of the station action plan. Just, we just would like to study all this so we know what we're talking about. Absolutely. Let me have the. 30 days. Okay. Yeah. No, this one right there. Yeah. So we'd like, we like whatever is in writing in 30 days. Absolutely. Who wrote this thing? Who, who, which begins Union Station is private property? Who? That who, precedes, who? I believe, all of us at this table. Huh? I believe that precedes, that came, that's, it's from the management office. Ms. Norton, proceeds. we'll find out where it came from. Yeah, we'll find out. We, that, that was established prior to us being here. Is it still in circulation? It is still posted, but is, it's being revised, as I stated earlier in my testimony. And Could I ask to be withdrawn immediately? Yes. Ms. McCain testified that other intermodal facilities managed to put their policy right on the website. This embarrasses me. Uh, here in, in the nation's capital. Um, so I ask that this be withdrawn because it contains uh, factual errors, uh, including a factual error that is an insult to the government of the United States. Union Station is private property. Um, most of these would, of course, be the kinds of things you want, no smoking inside and so right. forth. Um, but it is here that the tripod camera distinction is made. Um, and it is here that the Union Station management reserves the right to prohibit a photography of any kind in their sole discretion. Correct. This and is why I asked Mr. Levy to give this matter to an outside counsel. And, and in the draft that we do have, that has been stricken. So when we do go out to outside counsel, just be we aware just that so already we, aware. We don't, we, we'd rather be helpful than critical. Absolutely. If you would submit to us before anything is published so we can have a look at it, 
but I'm asking that you need help in doing this, and this is no reflection on you. Absolutely. The, the, would, we, would you like to also have the draft that's in place now, or just you want the yes, final sir. product? Yes, sir. We'd be glad to look at it. Okay, absolutely. Uh, rather than have people come back here sending us letters uh, and, and um, and the, confu with the, the confusion I'm most concerned about is, of course, the confusion with security guards who, who are left uh, really on their own. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ball, I, you know, the, the, the notion of a security guard changing, turning around her, I think that was an Amtrak security guard even. Correct. Um, if they were uniform, there are some policies with respect to security, um, behavior, courtesy, that are universal. And those need to be in, in writing. Uh, I don't blame somebody for being a little afraid if someone asks them a, a, a question about what their name is. So if nobody's told them that has to be in place all the time and you've got to, you've got to answer accordingly, then some people will try to protect themselves. Well, they don't have to protect themselves as far as I'm concerned because the fault lies with both of you, Mr. Chambers, and Mr. Levy, and ultimately with Mr. Ball. And, and so I'm expecting that in the revised training policy such as it is, because I can't find in place any training policy at the moment, that this level of detail will be in, 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 in the new policy so that this matter is off of our, our table. Our concern is with the comprehensive intermodal uh, concept and with making sure that private management, in fact, is in keeping with that, not with these details that we've been forced to spend considerable time with today. Um, um, what's the annual operating cost, uh, Mr. Levy? I don't have that figure with me. Uh, we Mr. can produce Mr. Ball would have that figure for the entire operation, would you not? Yes, I'm more familiar with USRC, so I had to go back. I'm sorry. So we have no idea what we're doing here in Congress. We're, we're giving money through an entity, and so we got to find out what we're doing. We, we, we can provide that detail for you, and, and along with all the docu other documentation we're submitting, to see to it that you have it. Thank you very much. And before you leave, um, before you leave, um, I, I want you to know that tough as our questioning is, it's always tough. <laughs> um, and as tough as it is, this subcommittee has a reputation for being of assistance to agencies. We had a very serious problem to occur with the Federal Protective Service, where we found a felon on uh, running a security matter. We found people not being served. Well, we had to bring it out. But we were closely with, this was a part of, of Homeland Security, we worked closely with the official in charge, the assistant secretary. And, and when they fixed this, so the contractors were paid on time and they reordered the way they did contracting and they put written, they put out written material and they established a czar, we had a press conference with them. And this was, this was, this is a Republican administration. I asked the Assistant Secretary to stand with me, very unusual, with a member of Congress to say what the agency not in my immediate control had done because I was so pleased with how they responded to tough questioning at our hearing. And my view is if you're gonna be tough in, in, and that's the only way you can find out anything in your questioning, then when the agency uh, performs, uh, you have got to be uh, equally generous in making sure that the public knows. Had a press conference. We didn't just write them a letter. Had a press conference. See what these people have done uh, in the administration to fix this agency. We are more than um, ready to do that to this federal, with this federally owned facility and working in partnership with you. Uh, sorry, Mr. Ball, you had something to, to say before you let leave? Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't mean that, go ahead. He <laughs> <laughs> just seemed to be befuddled, I see. That's all that was. Don't be befuddled. Well, we, we gave that example just because it's the most recent example of how 
uh, we follow up. We yes. really, even though the question the questioning may reflect gotcha, we don't do gotcha. We got we do. <laughs> Look, let's get together. That really was let's get together and fix this. And, and I can appreciate that. I think you raised some very valid points and gives me some chance to go back over and look at some of the policies that, that we have in place for a period of time. So, I mean, I, I appreciate that and welcome criticism and we'll respond to your questions. Um, you know, and, and I've been at Union Station for 20 plus years. I know back in 84, we received $70 million to the Amtrak for the restoration of the station and the city put $40 million in to rebuild the parking garage by Union Station. But since that time, we haven't received any other federal monies that have come into it coming to the station, you know, so, so what we've done- Why we set up a public-private partnership, because right. the monies received now will go into the intermodal notion. They're not, they're, you know, you, 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 the, the Union Station will and has indeed received funds, but it doesn't go into uh, its operations. That a public-private partnership is supposed to, in fact, make sure it's operational, sustain, itself. sustain themselves. And of course, we've got to see what your books show us on that. We want to see whether or not you're operating in the black or not. Um, and you, you need to submit that to this committee. But don't expect us to subsidize this public-private partnership. That's the whole point. That doesn't mean we don't have the same kind of oversight we'd have over a federal agency and we intend to uh, exercise it. Uh, I want to thank all of you for your testimony. I want you to know that the subcommittee, indeed the Congress, has examples of the kinds of things we're talking about. When we say submit something, if you like examples uh, or you like, uh, you like guidance, the subcommittee staff is prepared to offer you guidance on, on what we mean. We're, we don't mean to just leave you out there saying find it the best way you can. The best way may be simply to submit something to us to have the subcommittee look at it, and then you go back and and uh, it won't be we're handing down the law. It'll be for our comment. Then we will ask for your comments. That's how we do business. Thank you very much, all Thank three you, of Chairwoman. you. Thank you. You want to call the next witnesses? Um, uh, David Leach, uh, President and Chief Executive Officer of Greyhound. Uh, Amica Monami, uh, the director of our DC Department of Transportation. Thomas Wilbur, senior vice president of Ackridge. Our apologies uh, that you waited so long. Uh, we are holding the first um, oversight hearing on the first comprehensive hearing on Union Station in memory. And that accounts for the many issues that were before us. Your testimony is very important to us. Um, I th let's let's proceed, proceed with Mr. Monami, the uh, Department of Transportation. Uh, Mr. Monami. And then go to uh, Mr. Leach and finally Mr. Wilbur. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Chairman Norton, thank you for having having me here to speak on behalf of uh, Mayor Ant Adrian uh, Fenty and uh, members of the subcommittee. I'm Emeka Maname, Director of the District of Columbia Department of Transportation, or also referred to as DDOT. I thank you for this opportunity to join in the discussion on the current uses and future improvements of Union Station. DDOT has been tasked with the responsibility of analyzing the feasibility of future development in and around Union Station, specifically as it relates to the ability of the adjacent transportation system to accommodate that development. As such, my remarks will refocus on the Union Station Intermodal Transportation Center feasibility study mm -hmm. that DDOT is currently managing. Uh, before expounding on the feasibility study, let me offer a few thoughts on congestion and transportation options in the region. Over the past 20 years, the district has witnessed a tremendous explosion of vehicle trips within and through the city. In a recent trans Texas Transportation Institute study, Washington, D.C. was rated the second most congested city in the nation. Unfortunately, this trend is expected to continue. The Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments forecasts that vehicle trips within and into the district will increase by approximately 32% by 2030. We have seen a similar trend in transit ridership with Metro Rail breaking daily and monthly ridership records. At the current rate of ridership growth, metro rail crowding will be unmanageable by 2013 unless capacity-expanding investments are made. 
Finally, the Maryland Transit Administration also reports that most marked commuter train lines are running near capacity with some lines already at capacity. In order to combat these alarming trends, while allowing the city to continue to grow and provide for the millions of visitors to the nation's capital, the capacity to move people into and around the district must be expanded. The district is implementing a number of initiatives, including bicycle sharing, enhanced transit, transit service, and a performance parking program to encourage the use of multiple non-vehicular transportation options, which will reduce the number of vehicle trips into and through the city. WMATA is moving forward on full utilization of eight-car trains in the coming years, and MTA plans to infuse over uh, half a billion dollars into the MARC system over the next 25 years to procure, procure rail cars and expand and modernize service. More than ever, we are in need of a state-of-the-art, multimodal transportation hub in our region to accommodate the billions of dollars in transit investments previously mentioned. The historic Union Station has served the region and the country well, but its present infrastructure limitations restrict its ability to accommodate the current and future transit demand. As such, a new ITC is needed for the district and for the region to continue to thrive. The feasibility study began in February of 2008. Its overarching purpose is to investigate how to make feasible uh, the development, the Berman, Berman, Berman Place development, design and construction of a new ITC at Union Station, including the proposed commercial residential development. The study area of the project encompasses an approximately 20 square block site bounded by M Street to the north, 3rd Street to the east, Massachusetts Avenue to the south, and North Capitol Street to the west. In particular, the study is analyzing the impacts of creating enhanced access to the multiple modes of transportation at and around Union Station. The study's analysis is considering the following areas. A baseline transportation improvement study, new rail passenger concourse, upgraded Amtrak passenger concourse, improved emergency access and egress to the station, improvements to the existing rail concourse, tour bus and commuter parking accommodations, the DC streetcar and integrating that system into the ITC, a pedestrian tunnel from Union Station to First Street Northeast, a new metro rail entrance from the H Street Bridge, a baseline environmental regulation study, and then finally the integration of the Metropolitan Branch Trail to the facility and the possibility of an additional bicycle storage facility. So there's, there's much being considered in this study. Uh, it really is the first comprehensive study of the Union Station Transportation Network, and it will prompt us to conduct further detailed analysis and develop a framework for implementing the, the study's short-term and long-term recommendations. Uh, DDOT has, has developed two advisory committees to educate the public and key stakeholders on the parameters of the study. A community leaders committee was created consisting of representatives from the local ANC commissions, resident councils, neighborhood associations, and other community-based organizations. A technical advisory committee was also formed, comprised of over 20 business, government, and quasi-governmental groups. Both groups were briefed on the study this spring. Collectively, the committees will comment on the study's technical analysis and offer timely feedback. Since the early spring, the study team has provided briefings on the project to civic and citizen organizations upon request. Additional community meetings and a tour of the facility are planned for later this summer following their review of the draft report on the baseline on the basic technical studies. The data collection phase of the study began in mid-February and lasted through mid-June of this year. The data analysis phase is, is immediately followed and lasted from mid-May through mid-July. Currently, we are preparing to begin formulating preliminary architectural concepts derived from the baseline studies and anticipate that the study will be completed in the late fall of this year where final recommendations will be unveiled. In conclusion, DDOT welcomes the opportunity to lead this feasibility study. Its, its findings will inform and incent billions of dollars of future development at Union Station, but most importantly, it will create a path for major capital enhancements that will significantly improve and expand transportation options for millions of individuals traveling through and within our nation's capital. DDOT will continue to work with the community and other partners to complete this study, and we will look forward to implementing its recommendations to ultimately create a world-class transportation hub at Union Station. Uh, thank you for the patience in reading the testimony, and I'll free, happy to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Marmee. Um, next, we go to Mr. Mr. Leach. Uh, Mr. Leach is uh, the president of Greyhound. Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss Greyhound's plans to relocate to Washington Union Station. 
Rayon is eager to move to Union Station, has been actively engaged in discussions focused on making that happen. I greatly appreciate the strong support for that initiative shown by the subcommittee and the full committee leadership. Rayon has been operating in its current terminal location at 1st and K Streets Northeast since 1987. There have been off and on discussions about Greyhound moving to Union Station ever since. But up until recently, they have not been successful. Despite these setbacks, Greyhound has remained very interested in moving to Union Station. We strongly believe in intermodal terminals and are now located in over 100 intermodal facilities nationwide. That number has been steadily increasing. These intermodal facilities greatly benefit the traveling public by allowing travelers to use public transportation, both local and inner city, to travel seamlessly from origin to destination. The benefits to DC residents of Greyhound moving to Union Station are particularly striking. Over 50% of riders at Greyhound's current location get to Greyhound by local transit. This is so even though those riders who come by Metro Rail have to walk three long blocks with their luggage from Union Station or almost the same distance from the new Florida Avenue Metro Station. These riders would benefit tremendously from being able to just ride up or down the escalators to get from Metro to Greyhound. Furthermore, this dramatically improved convenience would lead to increased usage of the Metro Greyhound connection at a time when the public is searching for affordable and convenient public transportation. Fortunately, a series of circumstances are converging to provide a unique opportunity to finally make this move a reality. The Greyhound Terminal lies at the heart of NOMA, the area north of Massachusetts Avenue that the DC government has targeted as one of the most important areas for development in downtown. This means that both the city and Greyhound have a strong vested interest in moving the Greyhound operations to Union Station as soon as possible so that Greyhound can sell its property for redevelopment. At the same time, the Ashkenazi Company, the new landlord at Union Station, has developed preliminary plans for a renovation and expansion of Union Station's interior space. This will enable Greyhound to substantially reduce its Union Station footprint and the capital costs of its space. With the sale of its existing terminal, Greyhound will have the funds to build out its interior space as well as construct limited facilities on the bus deck. Finally, the, the support that the leadership of this subcommittee and committee has shown for Greyhound's move to Union Station has been very helpful. Your March 20th, 2008 letter expressing strong support for the relocation was a catalyst for this action. With all of these favorable developments, the parties have been meeting. I believe there's a common desire among the parties to make the move happen as soon as possible, but there are issues that need to be addressed. Amtrak needs to get fully engaged. Although the plans have been drawn to separate the bus and rail ticketing and waiting functions on different levels, it is important that there be a dialogue with key Amtrak decision makers on these plans. I met with Mr. Cumont on this issue today, and we've agreed to work together on any security or passenger full concerns that Amtrak may have. The plans for the renovation and expansion of the interior area need to be finalized and approved. The financial terms of the project need to be negotiated and agreed to. This includes the level of Greyhound's capital contribution and its lease terms for the occupancy of the space. Greyhound plans to pay for the build out of this space, but the contribution needs to be amortized through its lease payments and the lease terms must be consistent with Greyhound being able to continue to provide affordable transportation in an economically viable manner. The timeline for completion of the project must be agreed to, to so that Greyhound can move forward with the sale of its current property. The transfer date needs to fit with a projected move-in date at Union Station. I believe that all these issues can be resolved. The project is a very high priority for Greyhound and I commit to you that Greyhound will do everything in its power to make it succeed. I have been and will continue to be personally involved. I believe that other parties have a similar commitment and I'm confident we can succeed. Thank you for this opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Leach. Mr. Wilbur? And I'm a vice president with uh, Ackridge, uh, the Washington-based company that purchased air rights adjacent to Union Station above the rail yards. 
Thank you very much for this opportunity to discuss our plans and ideas for this crown jewel in the nation's inventory of grand historic buildings. Today I will provide an update on our project and describe some of the exciting improvements for the station and adjacent areas we are studying. However, let me bring, uh, begin by uh, expressing our enthusiasm and commitment to the long-term success of Union Station. As a local development firm with more than 30 years of experience here, we have participated in the redevelopment of the city. From the Homer Building, which we completed in 1990, to Gallery Place in 2003, and now in the southeast, southwest, and northeast quadrants, where we have projects in our pipeline totaling more than 7 million square feet, we have seen the District of Columbia become a world-class city, a place with outstanding architecture and mixed-use, 24-7 neighborhoods rivaling any major city in the world. Our company's commitment to the civic, cultural, and environmental health of our city is longstanding. In fact, our firm's founder, Chip Ackridge, regrets that he's unable to be here today, but commitments in his capacity as the chairman of the Trust for the National Mall have taken him out of town. Union Station is a unique resource which is representative of the renaissance of Washington, D.C. Because it is located at the intersection of the Central Business District, Capitol Hill, Capitol Complex, and the emerging Noma and near Northeast neighborhoods, our development called Burnham Place and Union Station serve as critical anchors for the development of the eastern portion of downtown Washington. Union Station is the entry to the city for every walk of life, from the Wall Street banker arriving from New York, to the legislator working on Capitol Hill, the metro rider from Silver Spring, tourist from Phoenix, commuter from Baltimore, or a student riding from Gallaudet by bicycle. All of these people converge and rely on Union Station. Our project named after Daniel Burnham, the architect who designed Union Station, provides an opportunity to reclaim the property over the tracks, currently a void which divides several important neighborhoods, and turn it into another great mixed-use neighborhood, bringing vibrant activity and economic benefits to the city. As a model, think of the Park Avenue air rights development at Grand Central Station in New York that occurred early last century. A little history. As you know, in 1997, Congress mandated the fair market sale of the 15-acre Amtrak air rights parcel, with the proceeds to be deposited in the Federal uh, uh, Treasury. In 2002, the GSA conducted a competitive bid process and accepted our proposal. We closed on the property in 2006, and since that time, we have been planning for a 3 million square foot mixed-use development. We've also been working closely with DDOT on plans to modernize and expand the intermodal transportation facilities at Union Station, as well as to preserve options for future transportation modes. Early this year, we engaged architectural firm Shalom Baranis Associates to begin the planning and design of Burnham Place. Like Ackridge, Shalom Baranis has played an integral role in shaping the development of the National Capital Region. Its list of newly designed and redevelopment buildings include the Warner Theater, American Red Cross Na Head National Headquarters, the John Wilson Building, International Spy Museum, and the Homer Building, a top uh, metro center which houses Ackridge's offices. The firm is also currently working on the redevelopment of the Waterside Mall, Southeast Federal Center, the old Convention Center site, and expansion and redevelopment of GSA's national headquarters. Our early plans for Burnham Place indicate a, a number of potential uses, such as first-class office, hotel, retail, entertainment, cultural, and residential buildings. This project presents a rare opportunity for substantial downtown redevelopment without any displacement in a land-constrained city. These developments will also leverage significant public investments already made in the area, such as the construction of the New York Avenue Metro Station and DC's Great Streets Initiative, which includes the planned streetcar service on H Street Northeast. The strategic importance of Union Station is what attracted our firm to this development opportunity. Its centrality to the success of Washington is also what has motivated our partnership with DDOT and our desire to help facilitate public improvements for the station. A more efficient, pleasant, and safe intermodal facility is critical for the city, the region, and indeed the entire nation. And the station has no shortage of critical needs and opportunities for improvements. Originally so, uh, used solely for inner city rail service, Union Station now serves over 100,000 passengers via 14 modes of transportation, in addition to thousands of visitors and shoppers. Many station places are crowded, uncomfortable, and pose conflicts for those utilizing the station for different purposes. 
Accridents development of the air rights presents a once in a lifetime opportunity to address these challenges. The construction of our concrete deck in connection to the north end of the station provide an ideal time to co concurrently undertake many important forms of modernization in the ITC. Some of the ideas that we're looking at include a newly expanded Amtrak and VRE passenger concourse with upgrades to the existing waiting areas, new pedestrian connection between H Street and the station to disperse the flow of people entering in and leaving the building, a new emergency evacuation roadway between Columbus Circle and H Street, creation of a facility to accommodate Greyhound buses, new extension of the Metro Tunnel pedestrian walkway to H Street, pedestrian connection between Noma and Burnham Place near First and I Streets Northeast, and an expanded parking facilities for tour and commuter buses. Executing many of these ambitious ideas will require intensive collaboration and support from the stakeholders who have a vested interest in the operation and future of the station. Anchorage is glad to have Amtrak, WMATA, MARC, VRE, DDOT, USRC, Ashkenazi Acquisition Corporation, and many others as key allies in this process. And we look forward to continuing these partnerships to study and execute these important projects. Thank you again for this opportunity. That concludes my remarks. And I'd be glad to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Wilbur. Uh, Mr. Monomi, um, I was pleased just to say a few words at uh, the DDOT community outreach, I guess it was, um, for, in relationship to the intermodal transportation study you are embarking upon. I indicated, of course, to uh, management and to the corporation that they could, <laughs> they should proceed on the intermodal concept well before we get this uh, mega facility uh, built. And nevertheless, your work is essentially important. Um, could I know um, first what is the expected time frame for the final report? Yes, we, uh, we plan to have final recommendations um, September, October of this year. Very good. Um, do you have any estimates now on the costs uh, for the intermodal center at Union Station? I don't believe we're that far along to actually have a sense of what the real cost would be. Um, I'm hopefully coming out of the recommendations in the study, we can begin then to put, begin to put some cost estimates on the elements and the recommendations that come out of the study. We'll probably have some detailed reports and technical reports to do to really begin to flesh out the full cost of the elements. Well, I've been, I've been, I've been you know, relishing this description of what's being planned, much of it public infrastructure. And then I've been scratching my head to say, how will we pay for this? Um, and of course, Mr. Wilbur knows that I've been, <laughs> I've been getting small amounts out um, toward the, um, uh, toward the in infrastructure the, uh, part of it. And Congress is very serious about it in the more public transportation becomes uh, indispensable is the only word for it. The more serious we gotta get. But have any of you given any notion to how one would put together a package that paid for uh, the public portion of this matter? Well, I, I think that there has some thought, some thought has been given to how that might happen. And I think in my testimony, I did touch on some of the ways that it is actually happening. Um, um, Maryland, the state of Maryland has already made a commitment to make improvements in the service coming from uh, both the Penn and the Camden lines that come in and stop at Union Station. Well, some, at Union Station, Mr. Monomi? Well, that's uh, most of it is focused on their uh, rolling stock for the majority of it, but I think that there may be some improvements that we could commit both from them. Uh, the improvements on the DC streetcar are coming from DC local funds. So there are, there are contributions that are coming from people that are being serviced from Union Station. I think we can bundle those contributions together to get some sense of what public resources are being committed to the project. And then um, we can also look across the aisle to our private partner. We know there's gonna be resources they'll be investing in making sure burn in place comes off. I do anticipate that there will still be 
some gap there. And I think that's where um, it's probably anticipated that we'll be talking to you and to tell you a little bit about what that gap looks like, what we think it makes the most sense um, to fund or maybe how to fund that, that gap there. Yeah, because we're talking train concourses, grand design, which is exactly what we ought to be talking about. Um, and uh, to the extent that we get some sense of, of uh, and obviously the federal government has to be uh, in this, uh, and in this substantially, I say that at the same time that uh, we're on pay go up here and it, you know, it's hard to eke out money. Uh, nevertheless, the reason that this is an intermodal system is that the federal government, the District of Columbia, and the private sector each have so much to gain from it. And so the sooner I, uh, obviously the more we are able to get elsewhere, such as from the reauthorization of the transportation funds for the District of Columbia uh, as one source, um, uh, the greater leverage I have in reminding con <coughs> excuse me, Congress of its vested interest uh, in in this project, Mr. Wilbur, uh, Mr. Wilbur, how long did it take you to negotiate uh, with Union Station for the air rights? Uh, uh, sorry, for the details that finally freed you up uh, to begin uh, to work pursuant to the air rights. Uh, we spent about four years about three and a half years from the time that we won the bid uh, for these air rights from GSA until we were able to close, uh, which was spent, some planning was actually done during that period, but a lot of it was being able to get take care of some technical issues with it and some title issues so that we could make sure exactly, it was a pretty complex set of, of, of improvements that were out there and uh, defining exactly where those air rights would start and where they would end was, 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 uh, was quite a bit of work. But over that period of time, we developed a great relationship, I think, with USRC, with the retail operator on the project, you know, with DC government, and we basically got started on our planning at that point. Since then, we've spent a fair amount of time working on getting our team together, and uh, I'd say for, it's been about seven or eight months now that we have been in, in deep levels of planning with this, with Shalom Baranis uh, and with two different structural engineers. Uh, one of the biggest issues that we have, and when you talk about costs, obviously the, the, the private costs are, the, are something we have to make work also. And you know, the most crucial aspect of this is how to build the platform for this project over those tracks. Uh, and the cost of that is gonna be, is, is the thing that we're trying to spend, we're spending a considerable amount of time technically to figure out how that's gonna you mean work. The platform for passengers to? Uh, Actually, this is a platform where the, our project would actually be elevated about 20 feet above the track level. You mean for the entire project? For the entire project. So basically where we have our air rights, we have to penetrate our, all of our columns down in between the tracks. And in some areas actually span over a number of tracks where the tracks start That's to That's not emerge. unprecedented uh, in, in this country, is it? it? Excuse me? Building over such air rights, is that's not unprecedented, is it? Uh, no, it's actually the most common in areas like Washington or Chicago and New York. I have in mind Chicago in particular. Lots of them in Chicago. And um, I think it, it, it happens where people, particularly where you have areas where uh, you can build very tall buildings and you have a lot of density because the expense of building over the tracks uh, is very expensive. And then if you have more square footage that you can build up above, you can spread that over that construction. Is basically the cost to build a platform basically for one or two or three stories is, is not that much difference that it is for 20 or 30 stories. It's, it's basically the construction techniques that you have to work on uh, by building this platform above operating railroad tracks. Well, let me let just say for the record, I'm pleased that you, you have uh, developed a good working relationship as you testified with the corporation. Um, committee was uh, frustrated by having to meet with the corporation simply to say, we don't care what you decide, but uh, in our judgment, it took much too long to get to the point where you could proceed. And you see, we've gotten, we've gotten to the point where now the economy is in trouble. Actually, I think that's a good time to invest in infrastructure. Uh, but that was very bothersome for the, for the committee as we looked at the corporation 
We knew that uh, Ackridge Company wanted to proceed quickly, and we also were mindful of the complexity. Uh, but there is impatience in this subcommittee to proceed, um, and the full committee, the full committee chairman, has been <laughs> the moving figure uh, almost since he came to to Congress, um, and he's been here um, almost since there's been a Congress. We laugh and tell him. Uh, so this is a project of long-standing uh, concern, and even as I press uh, for its realization, uh, I'm mindful that even on the best of circumstances, we can't get a, the new intermodal center uh, for years to come. I want to ask uh, all three of you uh, whether you consider Union Station an intermodal system now, and if so, why? And if not, what would you do to make it an intermodal uh, center? Uh, I haven't heard from you. Mr. Leach, maybe you should be first. Well, I, I, would, uh, I wouldn't consider it an intermodal because uh, inner city bus isn't there. Uh, there's some uh, charter operation, um, but we need Greyhound in that facility. We need other inner city bus operators in that facility. Uh, we're one of the but key. Greyhound cannot go in there until the new facility is built, or could it go earlier? We believe it can go right now. Are you in discussions that might make that happen? We are currently working with the corporation on, on those efforts, yes. Could, uh, you indicate that Amtrak needs, um, looking at your testimony, needs to be fully engaged. And um, you, 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 you say I am planning. I know that because Greyhound has come to see us uh, uh, knowing of our federal interest, but you, you say here I'm planning to, and, you know, no, no, it is important that there be a dialogue yes. with key Amtrak decision makers on these plans, and then this, <laughs> then you say as if this had to be done by now, <laughs> because there's a hearing, and you didn't mean this, but you just mean to tell us that at least it's proceeding that you meet with Mr. Kumar on this issue today. Yes, I actually had breakfast with him this morning. Well, I need we to know what you discussed, and I need you to know uh, that the notion that this missing ingredient uh, from the intermodal vision uh, needed Amtrak, and that a, quote, dialogue is beginning, makes us believe that that um, intermodal, uh, the, inter the intermodal may be very long, some long time in coming. Have there been any discussions before today with Amtrak since you detailed um, the involvement of Amtrak and the ticking counter and the rest in other parts of your testimony? Was today the first time you had a dialogue with anybody from Amtrak? No, ma'am. There's uh, been dialogue for approximately five or six months. We have a committee. Well, why do you say that it is important that there be a dialogue with key decision makers? Have they these been unkey decision makers? Um, <laughs> we've had difficulty in getting key decisions made from, from the folks at Amtrak. Uh, I've been assured by Mr. Kumat this morning that that would not be the case going forward and that we would get um, all of the uh, appropriate concerns that Amtrak has with Greyhound being a part of, of Union Station. I don't mean to put you or Mr. Kumar on the spot here. I, I, I'm telling you who's on the spot. Uh, moderate and low-income people in the District of Columbia who are denied what you can easily get in any major city worth its worth, uh, worth the name. And I have to ask Mr. Monami, what, <laughs> what happens? Uh, what, we've had complaints uh, about people being dropped off and picked up um, that made this sound like a one-horse town. Uh, do you have any um, information on how these companies uh, do business here, or are they simply uh, deterred from doing business at all because there's no place uh, to, to to, to, to have any kind of passenger drop-off? Um, 
If, if I could, I want to see if I can answer your first question about the whether or not Union Station is an ITC, and then I'll speak to the inner city. Thank you. But, um, by pure definition, I think the Union Station, and this is by USCOT definition, where the where two or more modes of transportation intersect, um, you have an ITC. And by definition, we do have an ITC. You certainly don't have one. We already had that at the time that Union Station was constructed. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so you, get, you, you go to the lowest common denominator, uh -huh. then you, you, you have one. And, and, and at, at the time, in 1981, they already had two or more, and yet Congress has been on trying to say, make yourself intermodal ever since then. So, Mr. Monami, I understand your pride in making sure that everybody knows that there are places <laughs> for some, mm -hmm. some uh, diverse sets, taxis for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I do want you to understand that Congress would not be talking about making this an intermodal system if all you needed was a place for a couple of modes of transportation to rest and then to get up and leave. Uh, in, that, in, in, in that respect, there are places outside of Union Station that would qualify. Uh, Greyhound qualifies, because I can get a taxi there and I can get a bus there. So <laughs> we, we mean to press you toward pressing uh, all concern so that we have an intermodal facility where everybody can, in fact, find access, perhaps not the access we'll have when Accurate is finished, but access to all modes of transportation, the nation's capital. No, I, I agree with that comment completely. And I think one of the things that we're doing, even um, on a separate track from the investment that we'll be seeing from, from Accurate on the development, is tying together those, all those modes of transportation there, making sure that there is appropriate signage for those that decide to bike to that location to find out where the other modes are, whether it be commuter rail, whether it be metro rail, whether it be taxi, or in one day, eventually tying in inner city buses. So we continue. We, we agree with you. It needs to be more intermodal, I guess, if that's if that's such a term. More intermodal, more tied together, more connected. Um, as for the inner city bus issue, very very well aware of it. And I think uh, the city's position is it's obviously a very uh, important part of our transportation network. It's transportation options for people across the board of all social economic uh, across the strata of social economics. Um, what we've been working on over the last really several weeks is we've heard the, the increased um, desire for more of those options to be identified and have a home or have a place in the city. Uh, we've heard from the business community that they're, they're, uh, some of the locations downtown are not the most ideal for the operation of the downtown, the central business district. They do take up sidewalk space and impact people's ability to move around. But we also believe that they have a rightful place somewhere in the city. So we are spending time learning more about the industry, not just the, I guess, the names that you hear more about, the, the biggies, I guess you'll call them, the greyhounds and whatnot. But there's other operators in the city that are, are getting started, and we feel that they have a role to play in our, in our service uh, options available to people. So we're identifying locations where it makes sense to, to congregate, provide space for them so that both the day-to-day the -day operation of the city still can function, and then also so people can get access, easy access, to those locations, and we're hoping that Within a few few short months, we'll have a more a more clarified plan about how to organize. So you don't really know where these folks are. Well, we do. We do. We have surveyed, and we know where. How many bus companies are leaving people and picking them up where they can? Approximately 12 to 13 companies operate in the district. You know, they're competing with you, Mr. Leach, aren't they? And the only they, you know, some of them can't possibly compete with you. They're not going to have ticket facilities. And I know it, in some ways it, the, 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 the accommodating them may, may mean more competition uh, to you, but um, I'd, I'd like to ask your view on um, these people who now don't have to even have any overhead <laughs> whatsoever in order to compete with you. Uh, we're for keeping the, foul, uh, w w w the fares low, but not at the expense of <laughs> traffic in the District of Columbia. So would you give us your view of this and where they should be located? Well, Madam Chair, we, uh, we've watched uh, as these uh, curbside operations have, have uh, successfully grown the market. They haven't necessarily impacted Greyhound 
or Greyhound's network of, of routes, uh, we have a lot of, of strength in, in the network. But city pair In fact, you're making, you're making money here, unlike some of the modes of transportation we deal with in the Transportation Committee, isn't that so? That's correct. Unlike Amtrak, unlike uh, the airlines, unlike WMATA, you're making money. That's correct. Now, we've watched these curbside operations grow the market. So what we've done in response to that is launched our own curbside operation. In fact, we think we have the most superior of those curbside operators. In, How do you do it, Mrs. Lee? In Bolt Bus, which, huh? which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Greyhound. And so we've recognized the need for competition in the city. Do they come to D.C., Mr. Leach? Pardon me? Do they come to D.C.? They do, absolutely. And we, and, and we and don't how do they how do they manage to, to leave, leave people? And I don't blame you. I would, not, I would <laughs> not do otherwise if I were in business. But how do they manage to come, come here uh, and leave passengers and take them away? Uh, we work on a, on a pure internet basis, so people have to buy tickets on the internet. They get on on the curbside and they get off on the curbside. And we operate in Boston, New York, New York, Philadelphia, New York, Washington. And those curbsides, you, you do, I'm not trying to put you, I'm not, I'm I'm not going to make you incriminate yourself to the District of Columbia. They know how to get that information from you. <laughs> we but share those, it all the, regularly. Those curbsides are in downtown Washington, somewhere or the other. Correct. Um, how, can it do, how can you do anything else? There's a huge demand that service. The service is being filled by people who are competing with you with nothing, none of the expenses you have. So you make your own subsidiary adding to traffic in, in, in D.C. You know, Mr. Amanami, you've done, a, uh, you've done a, an admirable job in transportation, but uh, on this notion, I don't see how you could have let this go on this long. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you had a way to get them into Union Station. I mean, Greyhound can't get in there until this construction takes place. But, but I don't know why you wouldn't have been pushing with, uh, with everybody else to get them to have some kind of drop-off space there. We're not asking for the tickets to be sold there. We're not asking you know, for the accommodations that Greyhound will have to uh, put up capital money to, to get. And we're just asking uh, for these, um, for accommodation, frankly, to our residents and to regional residents who are in in increasingly big trouble with this economy, so I, 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 you know, I appreciate that you're working on the, um, on the the um, uh, the the, the, plan, the intermodal plan, mm -hmm. but I'm, I I want to ask you within 30 days to get us the names of all of these uh, companies and your suggestions. We're willing to work with you on a temporary way to accommodate. These people don't have to be let off in the, in the most convenient spot in the city. They're just glad to get here. They'll get themselves a metro or, 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 or some other way. Uh, members of Congress um, complain daily about traffic downtown and try to get into our business, and I'm left here to, uh, to push back, but I need the city to, to help and and in, in particularly with the with the drop-offs, and he's already making them, you know, you can't just get on there and say, here's my fare. These Greyhound can't. I don't even know about the rest of them. But the city, if they're coming into our city, has the capacity to demand certain kinds of information from that. If you can't get it, they cross uh, regional uh, and lines of the, of the country, and we can get it. So we're willing to help you very much, but I, that, is, that is a big problem that we can get rid of with a, a little concentrated thinking, and I ask you in 30 days to get, at least give us your thinking on ways to do it. I mean things like possible destinations. They don't have to be the final ones. Um, uh, whether or not, because on this I have no view, whether or not what Mr. Leach does, which says, look, you got to, do it online uh, is the only way to do it. Some of these are the poorest people in the world. They don't, may not have any way, any other way to do it. So even Mr. Leach's people are fairly upscale relative to many residents of the region. Uh, you may want to um, consult simply with uh, Mr. Leach and his own subsidiary who will have some sense. 
but I, I ask you to proceed to do that uh, as, as within 30 days. Now, again, not a finished product, but to show us that you are starting on that. No, I appreciate your, your comments. That's very much what we had in mind. Actually, we were, I can share with you some of the plan interactions we did have with the operators and several months to actually sit down with all the operators and talk a little bit about you know, what has been their experience, some of the concerns, many of them that you've raised already that we have. Um, the one thing we've been very mindful of is that, you know, we want to provide as many transportation options to the citizens of not just the D.C. region, but from, frankly, the, the entire East Coast that uses this service. And we don't want to, uh, as, as you said before, we don't want to discourage competition in any way. We want to actually be a, a catalyst for, for the benefit of our residents. So we've been trying to walk a fine line, and we appreciate any assistance. I think some of your your questions and comments are very much on point, and we'll, we'll be more than happy to share with you our, our thinking thus far. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilbur. Um, do, I know this is early to ask, but people in your business <clears throat> always try to make uh, some, some get some sense uh, of where what they are doing is leading in terms of what those who will be there will need. So I, I, I wonder if you have any sense of the expected increase in ridership once Burnham Place is uh, completed and whether you, what connection uh, you see to, between Burnham Place and the rest of the facility. Uh, we have not had an economic study done at this time to evaluate that your first question. I'd say that the second question uh, really... You do realize that some people are going to be, let us look at the mixed use part, going to be moving precisely because you're so close to the uh, transportation center. Well, uh, yes, I do. I, I, one thing I would like to say is that I think 25 years ago, which when I first came to Washington is when this the plan for Union Station came about. And I think at the time, it was really a visionary thing to be able to bring retail in that area. And I think it has been a, a very successful project uh, in the sense of having the retail there. Obviously, 25 years later, we have a very different Washington, D.C. than we had before. Uh, that was a very neglected area. It wasn't an area that was attracting much investment. And I also, I th in, that, in that time, I think the advantages of mixed-use development has become much more evident to people, as well as, you know, the word smart growth didn't even exist at that time, which was the idea of, of getting development and putting it around, uh, you know, transportation hubs. So I'd say absolutely the thing that's really one of the main things that's missing in this uh, ITC is the fact of having more mixed-use development. And that's really what our development is going to bring. Um, we have some challenges. And by that, you mean what? Would you describe it, what you might expect there? Well, let me, I, first of all, I want to, maybe I could just tell you a little bit about the project. We have, we're still very much in the planning phases, but kind of how this works, because there was some discussion on that uh, questions earlier, and I don't think that the folks that were there were quite able to, to do it because they, they don't really know what's happening there. But I think you have to think about, uh, you know, first of all, connections, uh, which is really what this project is all about. And we are very much connected to the Union Station. We're also connected to the H Street Bridge, and the H Street Bridge connects us to the neighborhoods. Uh, the elevation of this project, if you're going to go to it from inside Union Station, you would go up the escalators up to where the parking garage is at. And once you get up to that elevated area, that would really be our first floor of our building. And that's at about where the, the H Street, the crown of the H Street Bridge is at. So it, that's, again, it's a little hard to visualize because you've got, we're probably about 25 feet above where the tracks are at. Uh, there'd be access to our project, both from H Street and to Union Station, and we're going to without going outside. That would go uh, the, the the opening between the the H Street and uh, the Union Station. Right now, we are looking to have that open, so that it it's an, it would be something that you'd have the weather in there, and it'd be something you could walk through. But your your experience going through that space is going to be superior architecture and it'll be retail, not retail of the type that Union Station has, but it'll be just first floor retail that, it, that would be engaging someone so that the walk that you'd take place, which is a pretty long walk, uh, would be a pleasant one, and you'd get, be able to get from H Street in the neighborhoods over to Union Station. And then, of course, from Union Station, you'd be able to come up to our project also. That, that area south of H Street, between H Street and the connection to Union Station, would have a platform that above the first floor, where the first floor would be all retail, we'd probably have three to four different buildings that would be built there. There would be office, 
and residential. Uh, that would provide the density that would be able to support our construction for the, of the slab. On the north side of H Street, originally when we were looking at this project, we weren't quite sure we could build anything there now, and now we are looking definitely to build there. And, I, and on the other side of H Street, north of H Street, we're looking at probably putting in a hotel, maybe a residential project, there could be some supplemental, and supplemental parking. So we're looking at a very dense project it's one that would be very connected to, to, the, to the Union Station. It would add a tremendous amount of daytime population as well as nighttime population and seven-day-a-week population for people who would not only use those intermote the, the transportation system, because the people that are going to be attracted to them are going to be to those, those, those uh, properties are going to be those that are either bought in economically and environmentally, that the best thing to do is to use the public transportation system. So I think that's good. The other aspect is you'll have the people there that'll provide more vibrancy for the area, which again makes it more of a people place because the transportation, the kind of the energy that you get from that is one thing, but you gotta have the people there and you want them there you know, basically 24 seven. So that's kind of our overall vision for the project is to take what right now has got you know, a, a nice retail operation there. Fortunately, Ashkenazi has taken over. They're gonna put a, a, a major capital in, uh, improvements into, that, into the retail. They're going to retool that for, for a, a new retail environment today. And then basically we're going to make them into a, a mixed-use project because we're going to be bringing the other uses, the office, residential, some retail, but a fairly minor amount of retail, and hospitality uses to the project. And then there, there could be some other things, some cultural uses too. Mm -hmm. But I think what we're going to be doing is making that link together to seem like a single project. And I'd say that that's similar to what we did at Gallery Place. You might you remember that we have a project that's next to the, to the uh, uh, Verizon Center, and we connected that project to the Verizon Center so we could get the synergies between it. We also had opening areas between the streets so that people could walk through, so that there was good transportation passed through, even whether it's on streets or even alleyways. And that's the way we want to have this project. We don't have a city grid to deal with here, but we're going to do the best we can get to get to be, get uh, the walking, make it a more walkable uh, um, neighborhood by, by combining our project in with Union Station. When you talk about H, H Street, a city as compact and small as D.C. can not afford that wasteland between um, North Capitol and maybe First Street or even beyond, and there it is, you know, nothing happening. Um, can't afford it, can't live with it, and we're going to find that out during this uh, during this period when, when, when we're experiencing uh, some financial difficulties. This has been very fortunate uh, until now. And we'll be more fortunate than the rest of the country, but um, even as I heard you speak, uh, with some innovation, um, I, I see possibilities for paying for this in, in infrastructure. When you talk about all that's going to go on there, I, if, you, if, if there's a will, I see a way uh, to move forward, given the amount of private, um, private uh, expenditures that are planned and the vested interest that the private sector, especially the commercial sector, has in its happening. And we've got to think that way or getting it done with large amounts of federal funds and the like uh, is, 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 is going to not only delay it, but make it Im impossible. Um, I, uh, who is your major contact, uh, Mr. Wilbur? Is it the corporation, uh, the public corporation, or is it the management uh, uh, it, uh, uh, that run, run Union Station Complex? We work through USRC, but you know we we are going to need to work closely with all the groups. At Ashkenazi, we've had meetings with them too, and they're excited about our our plans. Uh, and well, I'm sure you're briefing everybody. I just want to make sure who do you go to when when you need to get something done by others and by the corporation it's, uh, itself. Uh, David Ball is would be our person yeah. to go to. Well, that's right, and that's why I told him the buck stops with him. You just can't pass it because Congress created this public population, pu public corporation with almost no private sector members uh, precisely 
to be able to locate responsibility. So uh, it's, it's important that that's your understanding as well. One final question, <laughs> Mr. Marmee, not because uh, I had intended it, but somebody raised the bus notion. You know, that's my big disappointment with the District of Columbia because uh, for all the good work you've been doing in transportation, this notion about people having to go to Union Station and then pay a buck to come see their member of Congress. I have saved you from the perils of, <laughs> of members who, if we had allowed that plan to go ahead, would have left uh, uh, all, all, all the, your expectations in complete and total disarray. Um, I need you to come see me. I won't take the entire time. I have met with others. You've not been back to us. I will say that uh, we, there will be, the, we want to use the circulator. We think we've found a way to do it uh, without charging people extra money. We do not believe that it is feasible to send the tour buses. Uh, or the larger number of tour buses to Union Station. Uh, we will be using, we will continue to use uh, to the greatest extent possible the Botanic Garden site. Um, the golf court carts are underused. They have, I think they said two of six uh, on the average are what are used. Um, we are not satisfied, given the fact that you have to go to the front with even the golf carts. We believe there's a way for the circulator uh, to come up Constitution Avenue, let people off at the corner. Uh, we applaud your notion of public transportation. Um, we decided not to rest on having another fight with the Senate on going through First Street. That's my biggest, that's, that's my biggest uh, fight yet to, yet to, yet to be solved um, because I think you had a good plan for that. Uh, I want you to know the task force is looking at better screening for the buses. They have been informed. You can screen all you want to. Those buses are not going into the Capitol Hill neighborhood. They will not go across First Street. I don't care if you would, they're safe enough to put babies in. We're not going to increase pollution in that section of Capitol Hill. That lower section of Capitol Hill is a very residential part of the District of Columbia. So it's either the circulator, which has to be innovative enough uh, to get the dollar it hoped to get from rerouting people, or it's what we hope uh, and and are clear must be some other form of public transportation. I'd be pleased to brief you on where we are, the Sergeant of Arms. In the absence of the District of Columbia coming up with a uh, plan that would not be instantly overturned by Congress, the Sergeant of Arms will be writing you about the plan that will be in place, at least for tour buses coming to the capital of the United States. There was very deep concern in Congress about how long it was taking and because we now have a plan that we think will be satisfactory to the District of Columbia, we'd like to sit down with you for any alterations you might suggest in it uh, at your convenience. Uh, your testimony, uh, gentlemen, has been as important as the testimony we heard before. You're the real engines that make this <laughs> uh, run, uh, Mr. Leach. You are, uh, uh, I just have to thank you for keep keep pressing ahead uh, in terms of what you, you're, you outlined as what kind of needs you will have from, in terms of your capital costs and amortization. I mean, anybody in business would understand that those are the kinds of things you do if you want something to happen. Our concern about uh, Greyhound and interbus travel is that we have seen no will, no will on the part of the corporation or for that matter, even the people who have some to gain economically, the, uh, the, the management, uh, nothing happens, especially in a city like this without will. You make things happen. And, and thus, we're going to make happen uh, inner city uh, bus travel for residents of the District of Columbia. You're more indispensable than ever, Mr. Monami. You have a very tough 
um, you have a very tough mandate and you have acquitted it well. We're sorry about <laughs> the, 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 the uh, problem uh, that uh, arose uh, with respect to the, um, uh, the um, what, what do you call it? The um, circulator. circulator. <laughs> I always want to call it the commuter, the circulator. Um, but members of Congress um, saw that as a way for the District of Columbia to fund the circulator. If you want me to be clear, <laughs> that is how members perceived it. And I didn't have any answer to that because I saw piling up, um, as you know from your testimony here, filing, piling up the buses uh, at uh, Union Station. I thought it was a traffic hazard, uh, not to mention the dollar that I knew would be the end of it. Mr. Wilbur, uh, long before you get a, a, a the full-fledged intermodal cent center up, I ask you, because you are in, in, in business Ackridge has been one of the most innovative developers in the city to help the corporation and the management on the road to true intermodal. And the impatience that is reflected in, in, in me as a subcommittee chair about getting us uh, quickly, more quickly uh, to the grand uh, visionary part of this, uh, we are, we are we are prepared to act on. It will take private sector funding innovation to help us do it if we want to get the infrastructure part completed. Um, the likes of Ackridge are in the business of figuring things out of this kind, and I, I ask you to continue what appears to be a very good relationship with the actors at Union Station Complex and especially to share with them <laughs> some of that uh, creativity that has made Ackridge one of the leading developers in the region. Um, I thank Ackridge here right on the record uh, for uh, what you're doing for the mall. The fact that Ackridge, uh, that Chip Ackridge is heading the extraordinary effort uh, to solicit half a billion dollars in fund for the National Mall is an indication of the success you have had in your business, uh, because that is not something Mr. Ackridge would under, undertake uh, without such success, or, if I may say so, that um, he would be asked to undertake by the public sector unless he had shown extraordinary um, success in his own business. Thank you all for uh, your testimony at this hearing, and please uh, continue to communicate with subcommittee staff and with my own staff to the extent that we can be helpful to any of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hearing is adjourned.